Thank you very much, Chair. You are now live. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to South Cam's District Council uh, Planning Committee. I'm John Batchelor. I'm chairman of the committee. Uh, my vice chair is Councillor Haylings. Um, would uh, would Councillor Haylings make a presence known, please? Thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, everyone. Fine, thank you. Um, we are supported today along the virtual top table um, with the following officers. Chris Carter, who is Delivery Manager of Strategic Sites. Good morning, morning, Chair. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, Stephen Reid, who is a senior planning lawyer. Good morning, uh, good morning, Chair and members and guests. Thank you very much. Uh, and Ian Senior from Democratic Services, who will be taking the minutes. Good morning. Good morning, Ian. Thank you. Uh, I will introduce individual case officers when I invite them to speak. First, just a few housekeeping announcements. Um, please make sure that your device is fully charged and switch your camera and microphones off unless you're invited to do otherwise. When you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. When you uh, finished addressing the meeting, please turn off uh, the microphone and cameras immediately. Speak slowly and clearly and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone. Please ensure that you have switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt the proceedings. The normal procedure at planning committee is to take recorded votes and we will continue with this unless there is clear affirmation. When we move to a vote on any item and there is not clear affirmation, I will ask for a roll call to be taken. I will then ask committee members to speak into the microphone so that their vote is clear, both to committee and those watching the webcast. Members should respond for, against or abstain when their name is called. Now, committee members present, I will now invite each of you to introduce yourselves. Members, after I call your name, please turn on your camera and microphone. Wait two seconds and say your name and the ward you represent so that your presence may be noted. Please remember to turn your devices off after your introduction. Uh, my name is Councillor John Batchelor, Chair of the committee and uh, member for Linton. Uh, Councillor Bradnam, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm Councillor Bradnam, Anna Bradnam, and I'm the member for Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Khan. Hello, uh, I'm Martin Khan. Um, and I'm You're very quiet, Councillor. Hello, I'm Councillor Martin Khan. I'm the member for Histon and Impington. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Harvey, I believe you're substituting today for Councillor Fain. Would you confirm that, please? Yes, that's correct. So, yes, Councillor Jeff Harvey, um, I'm the member for Borsham Ward. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dr Hawkins, please. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Tumi Hawkins and I'm the member for Caldicott Ward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Halings. Morning, everybody. I'm Pippa Halings and I'm the member for Histon, Impington and Orchard Park. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ripith. Good morning, everybody. I'm Councillor Judith Ripeth and I'm a member for Milton and Waterbeach. Thank you. Councillor Roberts, please. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Deborah Roberts, District Councillor for the Foxton Ward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Heather Williams, I represent the Mordens Ward. Thank you. Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for Whittlesford, Triplo, Heathfield and Newton. Thank 
Thank you. And Councillor Wright. Good morning, uh, Councillor Nick Wright, Patworth and Caxton. Excellent. Thank you very much. So I can confirm that the meeting is quiet. Uh, if at any time members leave the meeting, would they please make that fact known to me so that it can be recorded in the minutes? Uh, so that members of the public are aware if a councillor is absent for any part of the presentation of or debate about an agenda item, then they may not vote on that item. Um, this includes uh, technical issues. We have had um, various occasions where members have dropped out because of that. Um, if it's immediately seen, I will hold the meeting for a while to try and get members back. Um, we have several public speakers today and I would just like to explain how public speaking will work. This meeting is being broadcast live via the Council's website and public speakers are reminded that by participating in this meeting you are consenting to being broadcast and to the use of the images and sound recordings for webcasts and training purposes. You will each have three minutes to address the committee. When you start to speak, uh, we will start the timer. Please ensure that you have switched your, your microphone on before you speak. When your time has elapsed, we will ask you to conclude your speech. Once you have finished, you may, we may wish to ask you questions, so please uh, be concise in your responses. If there are no more questions, you may leave the meeting and continue to watch via the webcast. Committee members are reminded that any questions to speakers should be for clarification purposes only. And the process for this shall be as follows. I shall ask if there are any questions if you do have a question, please ask to speak using the chat facility. The committee can only consider planning reasons for or against the application. The committee cannot consider general observations about the development site. The committee cannot consider comments from public speakers made outside of their allotted speaking time. Therefore, we request that those registered do not interrupt outside of their time. Once the committee has heard from all speakers and planning officers, we will form a view on the application. Planning committee will then vote. The outcome is decided by a majority vote. In the event of a tie, I as chair have casting vote. When planning committee members vote, please can they ensure that they identify themselves and speak into microphones so that the vote is understood by committee and those watching the webcast. Members are reminded that they should indicate whether they are for, against or abstain when their name is called. That's the end of the introductions. Um, we can get on now with the minutes. Um, so we're on item two of our agenda, apologies. Uh, Mr. Senior, do we have any apologies? Thank you, Chair. Uh, we have one apology from Councillor Peter Fain and his substitute is Councillor Jeff Harvey. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, we're on item three, which is declarations of interest. Do, does any member of the committee have any declarations of interest? If so, put your name in the chat area and we'll uh, just give you a, a moment or two to see if that's working. Uh, right, so Councillor Ripith. You wish to speak? Um, yes, I've got a non pecuniary um, um, interest in agenda item five. I have a daughter in year 10 at Impington Village College and she has a education health care plan. But um, I come to the matter afresh and um, we'll look at it 
you know, from a um, non-prejudiced position. And also item number 11, Water Beach Recreation Grounds, um, just that I'm the member for that ward. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and Councillor Khan, please. Um, uh, I, I have a non pecuniary interest in the sense that my two children were met, studied at a, a village college and I was formerly on the parents committee uh, for, the, for the village college, so I'm no longer on it. I come to this. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Bradnam. Thank you, Chair. Uh, like Councillor Rippeth, I am a member for uh, Water Beach, uh, so I'm aware of item 11, the recreation ground proposals, but I haven't been involved in any discussions about it um, in a prejudicial way, and I come to the matter afresh. Uh, thank you. And Councillor Hagling, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, for agenda item five, I'd just like to declare that I have been present at several meetings between the project management team, the applicant and officers to seek ways to address some of the issues that have arisen, but I'm coming to this um, application afresh. Right, thank you very much. And Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chairman. Just for, um, for clarity on the appeals section, uh, I'm the local member for one of the appeals, but just to confirm that um, obviously we won't be making any decisions on that. But for right. clarity, I am the local member. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I don't have any other speakers, so uh, that's declarations of interest. We now move on to item four with the minutes of a previous meeting. These can be found on page one through to uh, six. These are the minutes of the 13th of May 2019. So I believe eight of us were present at that meeting. Uh, does anyone have any points of accuracy that they would like to raise, please? No, I can't see anyone asking to speak. Uh, Councillor Williams, Heather Williams. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, yes, sorry. Apologies, Chairman, that was, um, I tried to do that earlier, so it's come through twice. OK, thank you. Really. My chat function may not be working. <laughs> right, bear that in mind. Uh, thank you very much. So, members, uh, can I, uh, do we accept these as a true record of the that meeting. Councillor Ripper, Chair. Councillor Ripper, please. Sorry, just one typo on page four of those minutes. Um, trailer is spelled O R rather than E R, but everything else looked correct to me. Right. Thank, thank you very much. I'm sure we'll we note that. So, members, are you happy that this is a, a true um, reflection of the meeting of the 13th of May 2019? Agreed. Agreed. Yes. Uh, no one against. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we now move on to the main business of the day. Um, before we get into that, unfortunately, two of these items are um, being proposed that they are deferred. These are officer recommendations. Um, Mr. Carter is going to explain why we need to do that. Mr Carter, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, members. As the committee was informed on Friday afternoon, an issue was identified by officers on Friday regarding additional consultation periods that had been instigated automatically by the planning department's IT system. This error affected a number of planning applications, including several on the agenda for today's meeting. Members were advised on Friday that officers would recommend that three of the items on the agenda for today should be deferred to a future meeting as it was anticipated that in those particular cases, the likelihood of additional representations being received, potentially raising new issues, was quite high. And so it would be pr excuse me, prudent to wait for the additional consultation periods to expire before the applications are considered at committee. For the remaining affected items, officer advice was and is that the committee can make a resolution to grant or refuse planning permission subject to no new material issues being raised during the outstanding consultation period. 
The only change to this advice that I would wish to highlight is in respect of item 9, 130 Rampton Road, Willingham. On this item, I was advised by colleagues last night that following a detailed review of the IT system, it is apparent that this item was not in fact subject to a further unintentional consultation period. And I can therefore advise that there is no reason why the committee should not consider this item today. Uh, in the interest of clarity, therefore, it is the case that officers recommend that items 5, 7 and 12 can be subject to a resolution of the committee today. Items 6 and 8 are recommended to be deferred to a future meeting and items 9, 10 and 11 can be determined today. I hope this is clear, but happy to answer any questions, Chair. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. For that, um, so I we, we need, need to decide whether or not we're accepting these deferrals. Um, so I will deal with those first. So this is item six, um, reference S4207 stroke 19 RM at Cottenham. So the um, proposal is that these are deferred to a later meeting. I'm proposing that. Do I have a seconder, please? I'm happy to second that, Chair. And are you including item eight at Long Stanton or are you doing them one? No, uh, we have to do this separately. OK, but I'm happy to second item six at Cottenham. Thank you very much. Uh, members, does anyone wish to speak to this item? Chair, can Stephen Reid would like to speak. Would he? Right, OK. Uh, Mr Reid, would you like to advise us? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it it uh, applies to all um, items where members decide that they can proceed today. You've heard Mr Carter uh, refer to uh, new representations. I have emailed all members to uh, indicate that in fact uh, there are uh, various options you can take in terms of delegation. Clearly, the uh, you can decide that where no representations are uh, made, that the uh, matter can be subject to uh, de delegated authority to the director of planning. There is a question that members will need to consider and that is that if uh, representations are, are made, uh, whether you wish to delegate to the director of planning for him to use his judgment as to whether they are indeed new representations raising matters that have not uh, been considered by planning committee today. Right, thank you very much for that. Um, I think that that applies to the ones that we, we will be processing. Uh, so we'll come back to that uh, shortly. So we're on the deferral of the Cottenham item six. I think I have some speakers. Do I? Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Obviously, the situation we find ourselves isn't isn't very satisfactory um, and it's not the first time we've, we're going to have to have this situation. We've had other ones which have had to be deferred because of consultations not happening or come back to committee two and sometimes three times. My around the deferral, my issue is that from the advice that we're being given, which I you know, I respect officers are there to give us advice, but it's down to us to decide what advice we we take and what we vote on. I don't see how it is fair to the parishes to be cherry picking ones that we will defer and ones that we will leave leave open for us to come back. So that leaves me in a, in a situation where I'm happy to vote for deferral if we are going to defer all of them equally and treat our residents equally, because I don't see how we can say that somebody's view in Cottenham and Long Stanton is more important than somebody's view is in one of the other parishes which we're going to determine today and not wait. And while I appreciate that's probably not the intention, I I think it's an absolute ridiculous situation, to be quite frank, that we're that we're in. So I think as a committee, we need to decide to treat everybody equally. 
and that means we either determine them all under the proviso that we've been informed is legal and compliant and we do it all that way or we defer all the ones that have been affected but I think this situation of we'll do some and we won't do others and, and actually people want this to come to committee they want councillors to determine these applications that's what we're here for and actually as a member we sit and we listen to all the representations that are made and I don't see how we can make an informed decision taking into views of the public if if we haven't heard from them and they've got still got chance to respond so I think as a committee chairman we need to decide if we're going to defer all of these or not and I would propose that that we defer them all let the consultation even though it was an IT glitch for whatever reason but it's just pure chaos if we start cherry picking and ranking some higher than others that's not what we're here to do we're here as a committee to you know take everybody's views into consideration and use that in our determination of applications and I, I don't feel we can do that till the consultation's finished, to be quite honest. Right, thank you very much for that. So you made a proposal. Do you have a second? Um, I will second it, Chairman. Right, Councillor Roberts, uh, you're down to speak as well. Do you want to speak to that? So we're, we're speaking to the um, uh, Councillor Williams proposal that uh, all those affected by the uh, IT issue uh, should be deferred. Yep. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I would like to speak now, if I may. Um, I support the deferral um, on the grounds that have already been put by Councillor Heather Williams. Um, and I think to um, address it as cherry picking is quite right. The very fact is that um, all the ones that we have in uh, paper form today have already been through a process of deciding that it was important that they came to the committee for um, consideration and decisions um, and therefore I would utterly go against the fact that it's been suggested by Mr Reid that this could be a get deferred then to to an officer. Um, clearly they were classed as important enough or sensitive enough, sensitive enough to actually come before us for a decision making and I think it's quite right we we can't um, be arbitrary here um, if they're important to come to us, then they have to come to us with all the information. And it just looks so bad um, if we say, well, some of the ones today, we, we, we can make a decision on them. Uh, and and if, something, if something comes in, um, reconsider it. Um, that's not our job. Our job is to make sure that people's concerns of whether it be their parish councils or individuals are properly considered and that the full allocated time be it might have been a mistake is actually strictly adhered to everybody not picking some and saying that they matter less so we can all look at them today what may be important to us may not be important to somebody else and I think we've got to always consider it but but I always remember a previous legal officer telling us that we have to remember how it will look to the man on the Clapham omnibus and I would say that to the man on the Clapham omnibus or the stagecoach to Cobnham um, it's very important uh, and we need to make sure that the public feels confidence in this council, that we are not being seen as some um, choosing, picking, choosing group of individuals who care about some parishes, but don't care so much about others. That's not true, we know it, but that's how it will be perceived. And I also fear that this will be challenged that what we are doing is not right. My understanding is that it is absolutely mandatory that a consultation period should be strictly adhered to. And if we go off on one saying no, then I think, God help us, we're going to be up at the high courts again. And I think it's, it's probably questionable in actual government guidelines and rules that we can pick and choose or as Councillor Heather Williams said cherry pick so 
you know, what is the harm, Chairman, of just waiting a little while longer? They will come to us, but please let the public believe in us. It's as simple as that. OK, thank you very much. I think Mr Reid wants to have a word again, please. Thank you, Chair, if I may. Um, I, I have uh, advised members um, in writing that if no new representation. Hello. Yeah, go on. Uh, that if, if no new representations are made, then members can have the confidence that they have he heard all uh, matters on which to make a decision. There is no question of making a decision prior to the end of the consultation period. Right, thank you very much for that. Councillor Bradman. Yeah, Councillor Bradman, please. Thank you, Chairman. I, I just wanted to say that I think the accusation that we'd be making a judgment ahead of time or picking and choosing is, is not correct. What we've been a, a, a recommended to do is to make a decision pending uh, the consultation period and if no further new representations are made then our decision goes ahead. If a representation is made then that will be considered again and I don't think it's a question of picking and choosing. After all the people who might wish to have made representations have had an opportunity to do so during this first period and if they then wish to do so they still can in this uh, further period and if they make a representation then those thoughts can be taken into account. So I, I, I don't uh, subscribe to the argument proposed. Right, thank you very much and uh, I mean you're quite right there, the resolution that we would vote on would actually say that should there actually be any more material um, uh, consultation data coming in then um, it would come back to this committee. So I, are we, Heather Williams you want to speak again do you? Is this a new point? Um, I just wanted to clarify that I can re um, reply as it's my motion. Um, Councillor Richard Williams has also requested to speak. I'm happy to go at the end. Fine, okay. Councillor Richard Williams then please. <laughs> Uh, th thanks, thanks very much, um, Chair. Um, I, th there were just two points I wanted to make following off what, what Councillor Bradham said. I mean, I think my, my first preference would be to defer everything just just, just because it is fairer and it, it, it looks like we're treating everyone equally. Um, but I think Councillor Bradham made the point that if we didn't, she was envisaging that we would say the delegated authority was subject to no representations being made, which is different, I think, to the proposal, which was no material representations being made. Now, I would be much more comfortable with a delegation that said uh, no representations being made. Therefore, there could be no question about us treating um, different parishes differently. So any we will hear every representation that's made in relation to the ones um, that we do defer, and we should hear every representation uh, in, in relation um, to ones that we, we don't, if that's the, the decision that the committee makes. But my first preference would be to defer everything. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Khan, do you wish to speak? From a point of view of accuracy, I would like um, a reference to the parishes having their say. I'd like to point out that the Impington application, the parishes have not uh, raised an objection. It's the, obje the matter has been brought to committee because the MEM officers thought that it was a matter of importance. Uh, and there's been a long period of consultation. So um, I think this point is not quite so relevant in, the, in that particular application. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Bradman, you want to come back again, do you? Is this a new point? Thank, thank you, Chairman. Yes, it is a new point. The other, sorry, I meant to say it before. I apologise for doing it in two iterations. Um, and that is that many of the applicants um, will not welcome a delay. And I think we need to where where it can be seen that we can make a decision in a proper and reasonable way. I think we should do so. And I think if we were to be delaying 
unnecessarily, as in the case that Councillor Khan has mentioned, um, I think that would be deemed unreasonable. So I think the, rec the advice we've received from the officer is reasonable. And I think um, I I'm quite happy uh, with the um, adjustment of the more precise wording that Councillor Richard Williams has suggested. If if there are any representations, I think we we should be reason. It would be reasonable to look at those. Um, I, I wasn't being so precise as him. I just felt that if there's the decision is being made pending final com comments, if it, as it were. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wright, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just picking up that we have once already this year been found guilty of making a decision while the consultation period was still running in the High Court. And we don't want to find ourselves back again there already when the spotlight is on us. And just it is transparent and open accident or not the consultation period has been triggered again let's act evenly and precisely and defer these till that consultation period is over thank you all right thank you very much um that's the end of our speakers councillor heather williams do you want to come back um, now chair stephen reed yes. asked to come in again for a clarification yeah i had noticed that <laughs> all right <laughs> Uh, sorry, Chair. Um, um, I fully respect the comments of Councillor Wright, but they are not uh, what is being put forward today. So what what happened in the case referred to by Councillor Wright was that the planning decision was made before the end of what the public might have perceived to be the cons the end of the consultation period that is that is not what members are being asked to do today they they are being th that it's put to members that if any new rep any representations come forward then uh, that the item would come back uh, to members that is completely different to the case that councillor Wright has referred to all right, thank you very much for that advice. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Just to just to sum up my motion and, and to bring members back to what the actual proposal was, I think some members may have misinterpreted. My re reference to cherry picking is the fact that we are not treating every application the same that has been affected. We are suggesting two different types of treatment. Cottenham and Longstanton to be deferred and the others to go through this other process. And I said right at the start when I moved this, this suggestion, this motion, that it's one or the other. We have to be consistent in our decision making, which if we decide to do some, choose one treatment for deferral for two of them and not for the others, why are those two in the eyes of the public for somebody that lives, you know, in, in Harston, why are the views in Cottenham and Longstanton more important than theirs? That is the issue here. So if you want to take that direction as a, as a committee and we want to determine things um, in a timely fashion, then they should all be receiving that treatment, not just picking two out to defer and not the others. And that is why I'm suggesting that we defer them all. So every single application that has been affected is treated the same. Otherwise, I don't think we are being proper, we're not being reasonable and we're not being consistent, which is what we need to be as a committee for the public to have any faith in us. And the actual answer is to make sure that this doesn't happen again and we don't have applications keep coming round because we shouldn't keep being put into impossible decisions like this. Sorry, Chairman, but they're my thoughts on the matter. OK, thank you very much. So we've got a motion before us um, that is for um, that we should defer all the, those items which are affected by the IT issue. Um, you, we, before we vote, we should bear in mind the very clear 
legal advice that we, we are being given, which uh, does not support that view. Now, I'm sure there will be uh, a vote on this, so I'm going to have a roll call. So, you know, the chair, if, chair, if I may. Are you sure you need to, Mr. Reid? I, I, I think so, chair, if I may. Go on then. Um, I, I understand the force of the uh, argument made by uh, Councillor Heather Williams, and if that is a point of concern to members, then uh, members can decide uh, that actually all cases will be treated the same, so that uh, Water Beach and um, uh, Long Stanton uh, are, are uh, debated, but you heard from uh, Mr Carter that... No, I'm going to stop you there, Mr Reid, because that isn't what is on the table at the moment. So I would like to concentrate on dealing with what we, uh, we've just been debating. So thank you for that input, but I'm going to put the motion to the vote. Uh, and you'll understand if you vote in favour of it, that is to defer all items today that have been affected by the IT element. Um, if you are against that, you vote against. If you wish to abstain, you abstain. So, um, Mr. Ree, would you turn your uh, camera off, please? Apologies, Chair. Thank you. OK, we're going to start the vote now then. Uh, Councillor Bradman, are you for, against or abstaining? Against. Against. Councillor Khan? Against. Against. Councillor Harvey? Against. Against. Councillor Hawkins? Against. Thank you. Councillor Halings? Against. Thank you. Councillor Ripeth. Against. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. For. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. For. Thank you. Councillor Richard Williams. For. Councillor Wright. For. Thank you. And uh, my vote is against. So that is four votes, four votes to seven. So that motion falls. So we're back to the original position where we are asked to defer two items, item six and item eight. So I go back now to the Cottenham item six um, and would like to put to you that uh, this is deferred to a later meeting. Um, I will propose that. I believe I've already had a seconder in Councillor Bradnam. Chair, I'm, I'm sorry, I'd, I'd, I'd like to move an amendment to that. An amendment to it? Yeah, so my amendment is Hang the on. fallback position I mentioned earlier, which is that we now delegate subject to no representations being made rather than the proposed, I think it was subject to no material representations being made, I want to make it delegate subject to no further representations being made. All right, hang on a minute. Could you put your camera on and Councillor Hawkins, would you turn yours off, please? So that the public can actually see who is speaking. Right. Can you start that again then, please? I'd like to move an amendment, Chair, that the committee agrees to delegate uh, the decision in these applications subject to no further representations being made. Right, I understood from Mr. Reid that that's precisely what we were going to do. I thought the proposal was it would be no material representation, so I'm, I'm removing the word material. Well, I think we've already done that, actually. With the wording that I've got in front of me, which is subject to to no um, new issues being raised during the amended consultation period. The issue is the word new, Chairman. It should just be no issues. Well, don't forget we've already done the consultation. Chairman, so I think if it's... we've already dealt with it, it's a. Uh, Chairman, I think I think we've got to be absolutely strict here 
Um, we've got to get the, I mean, we are very careful usually about wording. And I think it's imperative that uh, we actually have an amendment voted upon because there's an awful lot of difference between material and not Absolutely. everything. All right, thank you. I noted that. I would, yeah, it's an amendment. We will pursue yeah. with that amendment. Before we do so, I just ask Mr. Carter uh, for his advice on that. Is there any issues about just changing the wording to that? Thank you, Chair. Um, two things I'd like to say. Firstly, um, I believe at the moment you're you're moving to a vote on deferring the two items to a future committee. Separately to that, I'm hearing that members would like for the remaining items for which I've suggested a resolution to grant or refuse could be made today, that that is subject to no new, uh, sorry, no representations, no further representations being received. Previously, I had suggested no new representations, but I'm hearing now that members would like that to be no further representations of any kind. Uh, so that's that's my understanding. I believe that was also included in the advice provided by Stephen Reid um, earlier in the week. OK, so there's no problem with that element of it. No, yeah. Chair. OK, thank you very much. OK, I'm not sure we need the amendment because the deferrals, we're only talking about Cottenham and Long Stanton. Um, Chairman? Yeah, I'm just uh, just take, like to take some advice on what the proper procedural um, process here is. Uh, Mr. Reid, perhaps you could advise us. Um, clearly, the, the deferrals and the, and the matter of uh, the wording of the de delegation uh, are two separate matters. Should we take those separately or can we take that as an amendment? Ms. Reid. Is Mr. Reid muted? Yeah, he is muted. And Mr. Reid, can you hear us? Doesn't look as though he can. I'll try one more time. Mr. Reid. All right, failing Mr. Reid, perhaps Mr. Carter could uh, advise yes, on chair. that. Yes, Joe, I, I think I can help. Um, yep. Yes, they are two separate matters. I believe that you can take the two uh, cases of deferral separately and then for the other items, if members so wish, that they can uh, make their resolution subject to no further representations being received in each of those cases that are affected. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams, are you happy with that? Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, I'd be happy that at the end of each item we resolve to delegate subject to no further representations. Yeah, fine, we can just simply do the wording on yeah. each one of those. I'm happy with that. OK, so I can proceed then with the delegation vote, uh, um, the, the, the deferral vote, please. So we have a proposal to defer item six uh, at Cottenham. This is reference S42071019 RM. Uh, is anybody against that? Yes, Chairman, I have registered to speak three times on it. OK, thank you. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chairman. I'm against the deferral because if we defer Cottenham or Longstanton, we are treating it different to the other ones. That was the whole point of the motion. We've chose not to defer them all, so now we should determine them all under the same clause. So I don't think the deferral. Uh, you lost that one, so. Yeah. No, no, no. This is completely different, Chairman. Uh, oh, yeah, you we can lost, vote, lost you the vote fact against of deferring, it. Chairman, we lost the fact of deferring them all. Therefore, now we should determine them all as is requested. So I'm against deferring this item. It's complete reverse, Chairman, right. and I'm you. against it. Thank and you. I will no, have no, my no, say. Did. Ridiculous. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you, Chairman. Well, that's absolutely right, isn't it? We, we cannot have a situation here where we are using our fancies on one and our fancies differently on two. Um, we either 
look at none of them today or we look at every one of them today i think we've because had that we've had that right, chairman, so chairman, just let me just please finish chairman uh, let's say something new then please then <laughs> oh gosh chairman would i love to if you'd give me the opportunity the situation is becoming hilarious we are being so inconsistent now this council has an obligation for con to be consistent we are told that on numerous occasions on numerous applications by these officers who will keep interrupting here to try to get their point across the situation is we are obliged to do things properly in this council not at the will of a officer, certain officers, to contradict ourselves, make ourselves look complete idiots in the eyes of the public, and get right, ourselves thank you, thank you, and Robert. get ourselves into I judicial think we've got review. Councillor Roberts. Okay, I don't have any further speakers. So I mean, this is I, not democracy, I, John. I'm sorry. You are not being open government. You are choosing which ones you will go with just because. Some we've, officer tells you that his opinion is right. We've heard your argument and it's up to the committee to decide if they support it or not. So thank you. We, I don't. Um, Councillor Bradnam, do you really need to speak on that? Just briefly, Chairman, I just wanted to object to Councillor uh, Roberts criticising the officers. I think it's completely unfair under these circumstances. We are advised by our officers and we trust their judgment. And for, I, for one, believe that what we have been advised to do is perfectly acceptable. Right, thank you very much for that. Anna, that was no, the same no, case no, as the cases it, that please. we lost thank in the High you. Court. We listened to the officers then and they weren't right then. They may not be right now. You cannot, Anna, think that officers thank are you, going Mr. to know that. Thank best. you, Councillor Roberts. We're going to put this to the vote. So we, yet again, I would say we're doing item six. It's a proposal to defer to a later meeting. This is S4207 stroke 19 RM Cottenham. I'm going to do a roll call. Um, so are we ready for that? So if you're in favour of deferral, you're for it. If not, you're against it. And the option of abstain is also there. So, uh, roll call, Councillor Bradnam, please. Four. You're four. Deferral, yeah. Correct. Councillor Khan. Four deferral. Yeah. Councillor Harvey. Four deferral. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Four deferral. Thank you very much. Councillor Halings. Four deferral. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ripeth. Four. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. In the case of consistency against. Against, right. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Against. Right, thank you. Councillor Richard Williams. Against. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Against. Thank you. And um, my vote is four. So, so that's seven four in favour of deferral. So uh, Cottenham item six is deferred to a later meeting. We now move to item number eight, which is Long Stanton. Uh, reference S three two one five nineteen DC. Uh, I propose that this is deferred to a, a later meeting. Do I have a seconder, please? I'm happy to second, Chairman. Thank you very much. That's Does Councillor Anna Bradham. You wish to speak to this one? Uh, yes, Councillor Williams, please. Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. I won't seek to repeat the arguments. You can imagine yes. it's the same as before. However, I will say that the fact that I'm voting against this isn't a, a sign of my thoughts about officers or anything else. It's the fact that I respect that as councillors, we have a different role in this to officers and it's us that takes this decision. We can take advice, but we can equally choose a different course because we represent the public. 
Right, thank you very much for that. Uh, okay, I don't think I've got any other speakers, have I? No. All right, we go to the vote on that one then. So you're voting to if if you are in favour of deferring it, you're for. If not, you're against. Uh, otherwise, you can abstain. And this is item eight S three two one five nineteen DC at Long Stanton. Uh, do the roll call. Uh, Councillor Bradnam, please. For deferral. Thank you, Councillor Khan. For deferral. Oh, thank you, Councillor Harvey. For deferral. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. For deferral. Councillor Halings. For deferral. Right. Councillor Ripith. For deferral. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Against. Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. Against. Thank you, Councillor Richard Williams. Against. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Against. Thank you, and my vote is four. So again, that will come out as seven four. So the motion is passed and item eight is deferred to a later meeting. We will now move back to the agenda and get on with uh, our first substantive item, which is item number five, which is in Impington Village College. Um, this is on page seven to 58 of your agenda papers. <clears throat> so the proposal is for the erection of one two story building class D1 for educational use and erection of one single story building class D1 for educational use associated landscaping, car parking and replacement ground storage facilities. The applicant is the Morris Education Trust. Uh, the case officer will take us through the key material considerations. Uh, this is a departure. And the application is brought to the committee because this application has been referred to the committee on the basis of officers current assessment of the sensitivity and significance of the proposal because it is of local interest and represents departure from the development plan. The officer recommendation is for approval and the presenting officer is Karen Pell Coggins. So uh, Karen, if you would like to make your presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a small verbal update before we start. Um, obviously, the recommendation of the application now is a delegated approval subject to no further representations being received during the consultation period. A um, couple of points. The conservation officer has um, put in some comments. Um, a new flu has um, popped up on the building, which there are some concerns with regards to the flu, but this can be dealt with by condition. So an additional condition is requested to agree details of the form, construction and appearance of the flu through the submission of one to 20 scale drawings. In addition, it's been brought to my attention that condition Y has been repeated in relation to the screen storage of refuse um, in condition A1B. So the proposal is to delete condition A1B. Thank you. I'll just do my presentation now. So the application as previously advised by Councillor Batchelor is for the erection of a two buildings for educational use. One is for a new school called the Cavendish School for children with higher functioning autism spectrum conditions. 
ASC. And the second building is for additional accommodation for Impington Village College. So the key constraints with regards to the site is Greenbelt and Countryside, Grade 1 listed building adjacent to the conservation area, Flood Zone 1, a tree preservation order along the mature trees on New Road and partially playing fields. So this is a map to show you. So the site for the new school building will be down here. You see my cursor and the site for the additional accommodation for Impington Village Colleges in this area. So the green is Greenbelt's land. The dashed line here is the edge of the development framework. The pink line is the conservation area boundary, which is this side of the um, line. And this pink area here is the grade one listed building. There's another pink area here, which is a protected village amenity area. And the blue lines along the frontage are tree preservation orders. So this is a location plan which just outlines the site. On the site at the moment, there is a number of single storey buildings. Um, I've got some photographs so you can just see here. So this is the site for the new school. So there's existing single storey brick building in the centre point here with a single storey brick ground store and then there's a uh, so mobile classrooms, two large mobile classrooms in this area. There are a number of trees on site. Um, the trees along the eastern boundary along here will be retained, but the others will be removed. This is the tennis courts and the sports centre to Impington Village College. Um, these are obviously part of Impington Village College classrooms. And again, this is a two storey building here, which is a classroom building. So just um, some photographs to give you an idea of what's on the site. So to the left, this is the brick building that's on the site at the moment. The ground store, which gives you a view just looking down Park Drive towards the entrance. Um, again, this is the brick building from the car park, which is just here. And then you can just see the um, mobile classrooms behind the tree there. This is the view towards the existing classroom buildings for Impington Village College and the new one of the new buildings will go in this gap just here. And then there's just an example of the existing view from New Road. So this is view from New Road along Park Drive and you can just see an outline. Basically, the new school will be um, down that end behind the trees. And this is an example of uh, the existing design of the building of Impington Village College. So just going on to the site layout, um, we have the new school building here, which is a two storey building. Um, there is access works to the park drive along here and you will come in um, and there's a sort of turning turning area, one uh, in and out section. Oh, sorry, bear with me. Um, 20 parking spaces included in one disabled space. There is a drop off area with six additional spaces. Um, 34 cycle parking spaces. So cycle parking is here and over here. Karen. Oh, Karen, yes. we've, we've, we've lost your oh. presentation. Oh, have you? Right. OK, bear with me. Oh. Karen, you seem to be sharing your team screen rather than sharing the presentation. <laughs> Sorry, bear with me. Yeah, so Karen, if you just go to the, the top right next to leave and go to the box with the X in it, that will stop you sharing your team screen. Just okay. next to the red leave button. <clears throat> I think we've 
we've lost Karen. I think we may have Chair, lost. Chair, may, may I speak? Who's that, sorry? It's Stephen Reid. Yes, Stephen. Uh, Chair, I, I was um, only able to see the top half of the, of the slides. Can I check that everybody else could see all of the slides? I we saw, saw that all of the slides. Yeah, can see them. Yeah, yeah. So it's just you, Stephen. That's fine, Chair. Sorry. Um, right. I think I pressed the wrong button. Next one Next over to the right. Karen. Karen. The, to just stop the share. square with the X in it. Just next to the microphone button and the leave button. Can we just let tell? tell? Can you see the presentation now? Uh, no. Okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to um, get you back. Let me try and go out of. <laughs> Perhaps whilst, perhaps whilst you're doing that, Karen, mm -hmm. I'll give you a couple of minutes. We're, we're simply, we'll have a five minute break. Uh, well, thank you. Break, yeah. All right, members, so we're closed down for five minutes.
Thank you very much, Chair. You're now live again. Thank you very much. Um, welcome back uh, to South Cam's District Council Planning Committee. Um, and I think we've sorted out the technical issues now. So we'll return to the uh, officer's presentation. Uh, just to remind you that we are on item five, Impington Village College. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So the new school building is down here, which will be a two story building as previously advised. Um, it is 2,800 square metres of floor space on two floors. Um, the building is 56 metres long and approximately 32 metres wide. Um, with a height of 7.65 metres. The building would be cream multi buff bricks with red brick details and a single ply membrane roof in grey. There's also a replacement ground store, which is just here to the east and a horticultural room. The new single um, new building for Impington Village College would be single storey in height, have a floor space of approximately 350 square metres. Um, and would be for classrooms, it would be constructed from the same materials as the main school building. So I don't know if you can see that very well, but just an example of the ground floor for the new school. So we have hall, a hall, we have um, classrooms, we have sensory rooms and obviously ancillary facilities. Just gives you an idea. So just going on to the elevation. So the building has been now been designed to reflect the um, sort of character of the existing listed building at Impington Village College. Um, so just with details. So for example, there, there'll be tiles around the entrance which will match some tiling on the original Impington Village College building. So it's taking sort of details and materials from that building along with the sort of flat roof form and just giving it a modernist contemporary approach to the historic building. Um, just going on to the other school at elevations. So here's some perspective views just so, just so you get an idea of what the building will look like. So it is fairly sort of um, sort of flat roof and sort of a box, but with some um, features to break up the mass of the building. So going on to the Impington Village College building, so there'll be three general teaching areas, um, an office and communal area. Again, flat roof design, so again with materials to match and this will be single storey in height. So there'll be a feature at the entrance of the building to direct see people to the main entrance. So again, this is the same materials will give you an idea of the perspectives of the building. Uh, just an example of the ground store, so single storey brick building, very similar to the existing building, and it will have a bonded area to the side for an oil, oil tank. And again, uh, details of the horticultural room for the children um, at the school so they can do some work outside. The key considerations are the principle of development in the green belt, education use, protection of open space. Um, basically, the site is adjacent to playing fields for Impington Village College. The character and appearance of the area, heritage assets, trees landscaping and biodiversity, transport and highway safety, flood risk and drainage, neighbour amenity, and whether there are any very special circumstances. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Uh, OK, members, any points of clarification, please? Mm -hmm. Councillor Bradnan. Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to clarify, I may have been looking at an original 
um, site plan. Do I understand it now from the plan that you showed us that the grounds storage building has been moved closer to the school building, it was off at the northern boundary and it's been moved in now, hasn't it? That's correct, yes. It was originally near the dwellings on Perchel and Close and it has been moved next to the new school building now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry, my mute seems to be stuck, which may be fortunate, you may feel. Mm -hmm. But um, I just wanted to uh, congratulate um, Karen on its very, uh, very informative report and there's a lot of very useful information in it. I just wondered if in future I can see and on other items we've gone to some sort of new style on the front page, which from a public perception view, I really don't think is as accessible as the old one. So I'm wondering if, if in future we could have the other style um, that, you know, you can find your recommendation, but it's sort of buried in the executive summary in the parish, those sorts of things. Um, I think that'd be really helpful. My clarification on the application itself is around um, the Greenbelt, the processes just um, so we need to establish that it's in the green belt there's harm and the very special circumstances is that that's the test that we need to go through i just wanted clarity and for for the public as well because we've not gone through that for a while so the process around the green belt please thank you yeah so firstly you would need to determine whether the proposal would represent appropriate development in the green belt or inappropriate development in the green belt you would then need to determine whether there's any other harm as a result of the proposal. So, for example, character and appearance of the area, heritage assets, highway safety, etc. If that is the case, so say, for example, it is inappropriate in the green belt and there's other harm, any very special circumstances would need to clearly outweigh the harm through inappropriateness and any other harm for us to be able to um, approve the application. <clears throat> right, thank you very much for that. Um, I don't see any further points of clarification from members. So I'll now move on to the public speakers. We have a number of public speakers on this. Um, is Mr. Kelsall with us please for the applicant? Yes, Kels, would like to put on your yes, camera. Sure. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning. Sorry to keep you. That's quite all right. Uh, you know the form, do you? You, you got your three three minutes, uh, uh -huh. and then there's uh, members may wish to ask questions. So yes. when, when you're ready. I'd like to start by thanking members of South Cambridge, the Planning Department, the County Council, Environment Department and the Education Department and local councillors for working diligently with us as a trust, the DfE and McAvoy as the developer to bring the Cavendish School development to this meeting today for planning approval. The school needs to open in the academic year 21-22. The Cavendish School will provide education for a large number of students with autism diagnoses, many of whom are currently not receiving appropriate education or are accessing extremely expensive private provision at significant cost to the council at a time when the high needs education budget in Cambridgeshire is already approximately £18 million in deficit. There are currently over 100 young people in Cambridgeshire who should be being educated in special schools who are not. Failure to open the Cavendish School in the academic year 21-22 will mean that these young people will continue to be unable to access the educational provision they require, deserve and are entitled to by law. Throughout the free school application, development and planning process, the Cavendish School has received and retained significant support from the local authority, the local community via parish and district councils and the wider SEND education community. There is clearly a desire from all stakeholders to ensure that this school opens and delivers on its vision for fantastic education and opportunities for young people with autism in Cambridgeshire. I've mentioned the very special circumstances of much needed specialist education provision. A building of excellent sustainability on a sustainable site 
clearly delivers benefits that outweigh the harm of this development in the Greenbelt in planning policy terms. Additionally, being a complex development, we have worked with officers through multiple consultations and amendments, so it can be of the highest standard and overcome the concerns raised by residents and statutory consultees. I would like now to explain why approval of the application today is so important. These are not material planning considerations, but they provide very important context. We face the challenge of building and opening a school in less than 12 months. If approval is not secured today, this will delay the recruitment of the head teacher and staff, will mean that young people in need of this provision will not be able to access it until the academic year 22-23. And this will incur significant further costs to the Learning Alliance Trust, formerly the Morris Education Trust, the DFE and Cambridgeshire County Council. Moreover, it will cause further anxiety and trauma for families and vulnerable young people. Our significant experience as a trust working with young people and families with special educational needs makes us to determine to open the school as soon as possible, as we're acutely aware of the negative impact inappropriate and inadequate provision can have on the development and life chances of the vulnerable. Conversely, we are also aware of the transformative impact that the right provision can have on the lives of young people with special needs and their families. As a trust, we are committed to delivering excellent provision for those most in need. We would ask your support in doing so by approving the planning application for the Cavendish School today. Thank you. Yep, thank you very much. And, and the consummate professional, exactly three minutes. <laughs> well done. OK, members, are there any points of clarification that uh, you would like to pursue? No, we're all happy, aren't we? Councillor Bradnam, Chair. Oh, Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I don't know if you can see me. Can you see me? Yep. OK, good. Um, I just wanted to ask, are you confident that there is sufficient parking for staff in the provision that you've made. All right, Mr. Council. Yes, uh, we do that. that that's that's sorry, I'll put my camera on as well. Yes, we are. That's something we've considered at, as part of the wider site management process, and we're retaining significant existing parking, and also there will be parking for the school. The school has a, a small staff body initially and will grow over time. OK, thank you very much. Uh, any other points, members? I can't see anybody asking. No, Mr. Council, thank you very much. Well, thank you. If we can then move on to the parish council representative, then and that's Councillor Payne. Councillor Payne, are you with us? Um, yes, Chairman, I should be, um, but I appear to have a problem with my video. Oh, well, we can hear you very well. That's... Uh, may I proceed then? Yeah, do, the video? do proceed, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Good yeah, morning. I, I'm sorry, just a procedural matter. I have to confirm that you have the permission of the parish council to speak on their behalf. Um, yes, Chairman. Um, I was granted that permission at our parish council planning committee last night. Excellent. Thank you very much. So when you're ready, it's the three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to the committee on this application. My name is Dennis Payne. I sit on Histon and Impington Parish Council and I'm currently the Chairman of the Council and Vice Chairman of the Parish Council's Planning Committee. We have met with representatives of the Cavendish School on a number of occasions. That includes meetings with the Chair of the Governors, attendance at public exhibitions, and attendance of the project team at all our planning committee meetings covering this matter. In addition, when details of the application associated with the ground storage facility received negative inputs from the community, the project team went out of their way to meet with the concerned residents and representatives of the council and explore options and produce a solution to meet those concerns. The parish council's planning committee has been totally supportive of the plans and ambitions for the Cavendish School throughout this process. 
In addition, at the first meeting with our planning committee, the project team's ambitions to meet the highest possible sustainability and energy efficiency standards were discussed. The committee was supportive of those ambitions and encouraged the school to plan to make the best possible start. We therefore wish to support the school's ambition to achieve BREAM excellent standard. We sincerely hope that the committee will support this application. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, any points of clarification, members? I think it's just a statement of clear support there. No? OK, there's a councillor Payne. That's, uh, thank you for your contribution. Um, we we'll move on then to uh, local councillors. Do they have councillor Halings wants to speak at this stage or you're we speaking? The county county councillor David Jenkins. I have him on my list. I'm asking you first. I'll, I'll reserve my right to speak till the end. All right, fine. And Councillor Khan, I take it that uh, you also will reserve your speech. Yes, uh, my, my comment at the end. Right. Uh, and we have with us then Councillor Jenkins, who is the County Councillor um, for this area. Uh, Councillor Jenkins, are you with us? Yes, Chair. Good morning and good morning, Committee. Good morning. Um, I've been in three minutes when you're ready. Thank you. OK, I'm County Councillor for Histon and Impington. I, I'm also a trustee on the board of the Morris Education Trust, the Multi Academy Trust, which will run the Cavendish School. From a County Council perspective, I strongly support this application. There is a shortage of places in Cambridgeshire for children with autistic conditions, and the Cavendish School will address this. There is a need for extra provision now, and this school cannot open. That's why I would like to see this planning application approved today. Bringing this application to this meeting has been a challenge, and I'd like to recognise the role of the South Cam's officers concerned in making this possible. They have been very professional, they've rightly challenged the applicant when appropriate, and they've persisted and not wavered in ensuring that due process will be followed. However, when it was appropriate to expedite the last steps to enable the application to come to this meeting today, they did so. This extra effort was matched by similar commitment on the part of the County Council officers. I thank them all for what they have done and have every confidence that they have done it right and without compromise. There is broad support for this project in the community and I urge the committee I urge the committee to, to approve it subject to the conditions already proposed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, committee. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, any points of clarification members from Councillor Jenkins? No, I think that's a perfectly clear endorsement there. So th thank you very much. Councillor Jenkins. We can move on then to the debate. Um, uh, I, local members will no doubt wish to speak. I just say that um, the report makes it very clear that all the uh, statutory consultees are supportive of this proposal um, and all the speakers we've heard are equally supportive. So perhaps you just bear that in mind. Um, and uh, can we see who would like to speak now? Uh, Councillor Anna Bradman, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I, I think this is an excellent application. I'm so pleased to see that um, through negotiation and discussion that um, matters have been changed which improve the application. Um, and uh, I, the, I think it's an example of how people have worked together for a very positive result. And as a county councillor also, though not for this area, I'm very aware of how short we are of this specialist um, 
school provision and so I'm very pleased to see this happening right in the area where it's needed. We have very many children who are being taken very long distances by taxi uh, to appropriate schools, so having it here would be wonderful. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that um, I'm really pleased that the building does reflect the architecture of the Walter Gropius building and I think it reflects it um, appropriately and uh, you know it's showing due respect for the original building so I, I have no no hesitation in supporting this application wholeheartedly thank you all right thank you very much um, councillor Halings, local member please Thank you very much, Chair. And yes, yeah, so being local member, obviously we're very, very um, interested in ensuring that this application gets a proper debate and that we do weigh up the potential harms and benefits um, that it represents because of its sensitivity and the significance of this being a departure from our policies because of it being a development um, in the green belt. However, we've just heard um, such endorsements um, from the Education Trust and from county councillors around the need, the urgent and important need for state specialist provision for high functioning autism. And so it's not just a benefit to the local ward, but also for many families across the county. And we're very proud that this is being built on a, such an excellent track record of this kind of provision being given locally already. And in terms of weighing up that balance, I've been extremely impressed. This is how things um, need to happen, where when we do go out to consultation, and I would like to insist here, there have been multiple consultations for this application. And when they've received concerns about some of the key material planning considerations that we've been asked to weigh up in the balance, they have been addressed in the time that's needed to take to address them. One of those is neighbour amenity and urban design and character appearance, where many residents living close to that area were quite concerned about the location of the ground store and oil tank. And with the amended plans and the relocation, both the urban design officer and all of those residents have now withdrawn any objections that they, that they had. Despite perhaps the case officer um, showing this as, I think what it, um, she mentioned was that it was a flat roof and box type aspect. I think Councillor Bradnam has just said, actually, as the urban design officer says, this does capture the modern approach of the architecture, which is famous to Gropius and which has led to that being a grade one listed building. So a lot of work has also been done to make sure in multiple amendments that does respect the setting and the character and appearance. Another issue was around flooding and drainage and it was excellent to see that in this last stage county officers for flooding and for drainage together with the case officer together with the project uh, management team and the education trust were able to come together to make sure that they had everything assured in terms of the drainage aspects, which are now in condition R, were in place for this, for everything to be addressed, all concerns to, to be addressed. This is time critical. We have to ensure these students can get the kind of education they need for September 2021, which is why this application is time critical. But we can't approve it just on those grounds that it's urgent. I've been witness to the fact that this has gone through multiple consultations, that every single con con concern has been addressed and they are now in the conditions. However, I would like to move to committee in support of Councillor Dennis Payne, who is the chair of the Parish Council. This motion that we add an informative and in the informative we strongly encourage the applicant to adopt bream excellence in all energy aspects and in all other relevant areas too um, and chair that's a motion that i would um, like to put to the committee before any final decision is made thank you 
All right, thank you very much. So that's a proposal which is noted. Yeah. Just get the speakers through. Do you want a seconder for that, Chairman? Well, not at this stage. I'll come back to that. Thank okay. you. Um, Councillor Heather Williams, please, if you'd like to speak. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so reading through the application, um, obviously we, we have a balance. We, we always do. Um, and, you know, it can't be in doubt that obviously this is outside of our policies and policies that many of us, including myself, hold very dearly because they are protection. But quite rightly, in special circumstances, in situations such as these, I think it is appropriate that we make a conscious decision to support an application against our policies. And this is the right place for us to do it because you know we're councillors, we set the, the uh, local plan, it's up to us if we want to deviate from it. And I'm minded having read and given due care and attention to the report and, and listened carefully to our, our local member that just spoke, that that is the appropriate recommendation and I'm very happy to offer my support to this application. I, I know how important these issues are. Um, my daughter doesn't have autism, but she does receive special educational needs and the support she gets is, is brilliant in her special educational needs plan, um, but they need more facilities for other areas. And I'm, I'm just more than pleased to support it. Um, on the motion that Councillor Haling's made, um, I would be happy to support as well, but I would like some advice as to whether it would meet the six reasonable tests. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Ripeth, please. You're muted. Apologies. In my opinion, this far outweighs any harm to the green belt and is a proposal that we need to support today um, and cannot come soon enough. So I hope everybody else um, would like to support it. Right, thank you very much. And uh, Councillor Khan, other local member, please. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> So get the camera on again. Uh, OK. M my comment really here is that um, I would want to really first thing I want to say additional declaration of interest. My wife is on the planning committee of the parish council um, and also I did see some of the presentations before the um, before the uh, application. Uh, so I but I'm approaching this afresh on, on these matters as well. Thank you. So I really just want to do support what uh, Councillor Hainings has said, but also in addition comment about the uh, imp impact on the Green Belt in terms of the fact that the existing buildings on the site are, are unsightly, uh, really uh, a bit of an eyesore, and you are replacing this with a fine building. It's actually quite, although it uh, follows the uh, modern line of a Gropius building, it's actually quite distant from the building uh, and there are other buildings in between. But I want to draw uh, attention to the comparison between uh, that and K Block, which is also in the Green Belt and the new building within the school, which doesn't follow in, uh, doesn't have the same uh, following of the uh, the Gropius design. Um, this is a, a much better, uh, a much more sympathetic design in term, in that, those terms. So I, I think in visual terms is actually proving a, a, an enhancement of the Green Belt compared with what is there now. Uh, and so um, on those grounds as well, I would like to support it um, uh, in, in general, very much in favour of this application, of this development. All right, thank you very much. And Councillor Bradnam, you want to come back again, do you? Thank you, Chairman. It was just, I, I forgot to mention before that this planning committee has previously looked at applications in the Green Belt and weighed up whether they were um, appropriate to approve or not. And the example I'm remembering is the Arthur Rank Hospice. And in that case, this application has done a similar exercise of doing a search for sites and they have identified this as the most appropriate site. And, and I just wanted to confirm 
confirm my view that this that the approach to finding a suitable site has been appropriate and i i think the the benefits that would be conferred by this application do outweigh the harm to the green belt and for that reason i think we should approve it i'm happy to um propose if any or second second that if anybody wishes to propose it well we have an, an, an amendment first uh, which i'm just going to go back to now so thank you very much for that councillor bradnam if i go go back to councillor hailings please um could you um, give some words around your informative please thank you chair and i just sort of like to give it a bit of context which is you know we have declared a climate emergency. We do have a zero carbon strategy. Um, and just as this application has shown excellence in the way that it's dealing with consultation um, and the design, we want to be able to support everybody in ensuring that it's exemplary also in terms of sustainability. Now, our local plan, the existing one, does not enable us to put a condition to require green excellence. But I have been advised by officers that an informative that strongly encourages, and this is the wording I would like, that we have an, inf an informative additional, which strongly encourages the applicant to adopt BREEAM excellence in all energy related aspects and in all other relevant areas. And I'd just like to confirm that I have received reassurance from the project management team that the applicant would be able to adopt such measures if the committee were um, were moved to approve this. Right, thank you very much for that. Um, just before we move to uh, any discussion on that, I'd just like um, Mr Carter to make sure that uh, there's no issues that this raises which may complicate anything in particular. Thank you, Chair. No, I'm happy to advise uh, that uh, we're OK to proceed on this basis. Just quickly in response to Heather Williams point, um, as this isn't proposed to be a planning condition, it's, it's just an informative, uh, then there's no, no issue with the tests that she'd cited there. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. OK, members, uh, does anybody want to speak to that? I think it's perfectly straightforward. I'm happy to second the amendment if you wish that. OK, well, thank you. So we have a proposer and a seconder, and this is to strongly urge the adoption of green e excellence standards. Um, is it, can I take this uh, through affirmative? Or? Yes, agreed. 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 Right. agreed. No one against? No one abstaining. Agreed. OK, so that's uh, agreed by affirmation. We therefore now um, move to the main recommendation, which is on page 49 of your papers, um, paragraph 213. So that would now be as delegated approval, subject to no issues being raised during the amendment consultation, amended consultation period subject to referral of the application to the Secretary of State as a departure, together with the conditioning which the officer has already outlined. So are we in favour of that? Agreed. It's affirmative. Agreed. 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 Right, no one against? No, that's, uh, that's passed then. So we approve that one. Uh, thank you very much. Um, item six has already been deferred at Cottenham. And so now, members, we're moving on to item seven. This is Arston, uh, pages 137 through to 172. So it's Arston. The reference is S40571900. Um, the proposal is for outline planning permission for the demolition of an existing buildings and provision of up to 16 dwellings, up to 120 square metres of office accommodation, access, public open space and landscaping 
including details of access and with all other matters reserved. Um, the applicant is Access Land Partnership. The case officer will take us through the material considerations. Uh, this is not a departure. And it's coming before the committee because of the request of the local member and the parish council. The presenting officer is Karen Pell Coggins. Uh, if you'd like to make your presentation, please, Karen. Thank you, Chair. Um, with regards to the recommendation, it will be a delegated refusal subject to no further representations being received during the consultation period. Um, just to note, members, in your plans pack, there is a couple of elevations of buildings, um, of houses and an annex, which doesn't actually relate to this application. Um, apologies, I'm not quite sure how that managed to get there. Um, but yeah, go on to my presentation now. So the site is located outside the Harston development framework and within the Greenbelt. The key constraints are Greenbelt and countryside. The site is previously developed land. It's within flood zone one, low risk and there's a railway line along the southeastern boundary um, and mature trees along the northwestern boundary. So just an example, the site is down here, which is wholly within the green belts. The This is the rest of Harston village. So the dashed line is the village framework. There is a listed building just here. The railway line goes along the to the southeast um, and this is station road along here. So the existing site has um, a one and a half storey building along the southeastern boundary adjacent to the railway line which has a um, use for sort of storage warehouse purposes. In addition there's a two storey office building centrally within the site just here. To the rear of the that's probably an easier plan to see. To the rear of the office building, there is an open storage area which has permission for storage up to 2.4 metres in height. Um, again, there's hard standing to the back and then there's a range of single storey buildings right at the bottom of the site on the boundary. Um, so the mature trees are alongside the boundary with the residential property known as Chip Top to the north and there is a Leylandi hedge along the southern southeastern boundary adjacent to the railway. This is Station House which is a residential property um, which does not fall within the application site. So the just examples of buildings which are on the site at the moment. So the first one this is Station House in the corner um, with the sort of warehouse storage building to the rear and then you can see the office building. And then just looking, so this is looking from the rear of the site back towards the back of the office building and the storage building. So it shows the open storage. And then again, another photograph looking towards the rear boundary with single story buildings on the rear boundary. This is a view of the site from Newton Road. So the, so to the east, I believe. Um, so this is Station Road. Um, obviously the level crossing is here and then the land rises up to a hill on Newton Road. Um, you can see the existing Leyland I screen on the site with the railway line just in front of that. So the proposed proposal is for the erection of up to 16 dwellings and 120 square metres of office floor space. The buildings would be two storey in height, so in a layout at right angles to Station Road. So just an example, the residential development is this um, pale orange area just here. And then the employment development is the darker orange area just here. 
to the, this side, there is um, details of the public open space, which will be a local area of play. Main access road through the site will be just um, down here, and there'll be two small turning areas, and this will access the some garages to the properties at Front Station Road. So again, building heights, they will all be two storey in height across the site. So the illustrative master plan, it's an outline application. So the current plan is illustrative only, but it shows, um, again, this is the employment building here with parking next to that. And then you've got various terraces of properties, um, a terrace of properties along the frontage of station road, and then a, linear form of development at right angles to station road coming down here with again terraces and semi-detached properties and then you have the larger detached properties at the back and here is an axonometric view of an example of what the development may look like so again you've got the two-story buildings this is the employment building here the existing station house um, and tip tofts house uh, the open space and the detached properties down there. So the key considerations are the principle of development in the green belts, loss of employment, location and scale of residential development, housing density, housing mix, affordable housing, developer contributions, the character and appearance of the area, heritage assets, trees and landscaping and biodiversity, highway safety, flood risk, neighbour immunity, and whether there are any very special circumstances. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, members, any points of clarification with the case officer? Can't see any in there. OK, good, thank you very much. We can then go uh, to the... Chairman, I, I Chair, hello. Hello, Bradnam. Thank you. Councillor Bradnam. Thank you very much, Chair. I just wanted to ask um, Ms. Pell Coggins um, whether the fact that this is a brownfield site in the green belt needs to um, needs to weigh in our obviously it weighs in our how it should be weighed in terms sorry whether it represents a different presentation sorry. I'm not being very clear whether we need to take that into account, the fact that it's a brownfield site in the green belt rather than just say um, green belt per se. So the policy, um, the paragraph in the MPPF is slightly different in relation to brownfield sites. Um, that is in the report, um, but I will just read it out to you. It says when determining whether a development's appropriate or inappropriate. Partial or complete redevelopment of previously developed land which would not have a greater impact upon the openness of the green belt than the existing development or not cause substantial harm to the openness of the green belt where the development would contribute to meeting an identified affordable housing need within the area. So that's when determining whether a development is appropriate or not in the green belt. So it's slightly different test for previously developed land than what it is for land that has not been previously so, developed. So it hinges on the perceived harm compared to the existing harm. Yes, and whether that's substantial or not. Thank but you. then you also have to take into the balance of obviously affordable housing needs as well. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think um, Karen just mentioned now that we also need to take into account the need for affordable housing. That was what I wanted to clarify in that the requirement for affordable housing should also bear um, significance in what in how we weigh up this application. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's all the members comments. Can we then move on to public speakers? We have a number of public speakers here. Is Mr Cosgrove with us please? Yes, good morning Chair. 
Cool. Good morning, Mr. Cosgrove. Uh, can you you can see and hear me OK? I can hear you. Can't see at the moment. Yeah, OK, we're all there. Thank you very much. Sorry to keep you. Uh, no problem at all. Good morning, Cosgrove, and thank you very much, Chair, for allowing me to speak today. OK, you know, the, the drill will do you is three minutes and then they may well want to ask questions. So whenever you're ready, please. Well, hopefully I won't need the full three minutes. I'm here to represent Mr. and Mrs. Norman, who are the owners of Tip Toft's house, the dwelling immediately to the northwest. Um, they don't object to the principle of the application, but they do have very grave concerns about the impact on their trees that run along the boundary. Uh, these trees have been assessed as being worthy of a TPO and an application for a tree protection order has been made. I'd just like to make the members aware that just inside the boundary, those trees are covered by about a meter thick concrete plinth and none of the tree protection documents or the details dealing with the trees have addressed how that could be removed without causing substantial harm or loss to the trees. And um, because the application is an outline, that's not really something that could be addressed uh, satisfactorily as it is part of the reserve matters application. We need to know now. And there could be very substantial costs to that, which would have an impact on what level of affordable housing could perhaps be provided on the site. They haven't seen a viability assessment that has addressed that. So I think that's a question that's still very much open, open in the air. Um, further issue is, although the, the outline is only an indicative outline showing where the houses are, you'll note that the rear gardens are very shallow and some of the dwellings, particularly the ones to the front, sit within the tree protection area and would lead to harm to the trees. And those shallow gardens would lead to an enormous amount of pressure for any for future residents of those houses to have those trees cut back or removed entirely, which would cause substantial harm to the character and appearance of the area because those trees are a very important landscape feature. There is a slight further issue, but one of much less importance, which is to do with drainage. The field immediately to the rear uh, to the west of the site has a network of pipes running through it to drain it because the land is quite boggy and admittedly the quantity of this development would lead to the quantity of hard surface being substantially reduced but we don't really know from the documents submitted how the actual water flows would be affected by this and it's, it's interesting to note that the land level because it is concrete concrete plinth between the application site and tip tops house changes by about a meter and there are drainage holes drilled in the concrete plinth. So they do have some concerns about how the water flows would alter based on if this development were to go ahead. So really our comments just entirely hinge around the impact of this proposed development on those trees. And um, really don't think that what's been submitted so far adequately addresses how those trees could be protected long term. Uh, so thanks very much for your time today. Right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure all those points are noted by officers and uh, as you say, this is outlined at the moment. And I know the tree officer has already made an initial report and I'm sure they'll take that on board. Um, Councillor Hawkins, do you want a point of clarification? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. But I think Councillor Khan was before me. I, 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 I simply wanted to speak to the officer and that's finished now, so forget it. We can continue with Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, okay. carry on, Councillor. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for that. I, I just wanted to, because I'm not quite sure I understand um, the issue you raised about the concrete plinth. The concrete plinth surely is in the application site. Is that correct? It is indeed. But okay. the, trees are, the trees themselves are not. The roots run under the concrete plinth and if that was to be removed, that would lead to potentially the loss of the trees and certainly severe harm to them. The way of doing that, there possibly is an engineering solution, but you'd need to know that now at the outline stage, how they propose to do it. It's not something that could really be left to the reserve matters. It's unsure how, if it can be done at all, and if it can be done, we need to know how. Okay, so your concern is to the damage, potential damage that you reckon the removal of the concrete plinth will do? Yes, and um, whether that can be done at all, and if it can be done, what harm would result in it? 
And then the secondary issue is the houses being too close to the trees. That would really overshadow the gardens of those houses and lead to a lot of pressure from the residents there to cut them back. So does that mean that the canopy of those trees actually protrudes into the application site? Yes, by quite, quite a way. Yeah. OK, thank you. All right, thank you very much. I haven't got any other questions. Uh, so, Mr. Cosgrove, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for your time, Chair. Thank you. And could we then move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Mr. Adams, who is representing the applicant, I believe. Are you with us, Mr. Adams? Hello, Hello. can you hear me? Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, so I think you know the drill. You've got your three minutes sure, sure. So whenever, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Right, right. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Uh, my name's Andrew Adams. I'm the Senior Land Manager of Access Land Partnerships, the applicant for this application, which seeks outline planning permission with all matters reserved apart from access. The proposals seek to uh, remove the existing buildings and structures within the site and replace with new dwelling houses, 40% of which would be provided as affordable housing. Employment generating office space would also be provided. As officers have made clear, the application site comprises, uh, comprises a brownfield land within the Greenbelt and is situated on the edge of Harston. We have a respectful working relationship with officers. However, in this instance, I feel strongly that the officer recommendation of refusal is wrong. The reasons for refusal solely concern matters of judgment, and it is entirely appropriate for this committee to reach an alternative view to that offered by officers on such matters. Officers suggest that the development proposals would comprise inappropriate development within the Greenbelt, as defined by national planning policy. This is incorrect. The MPPF is clear at Para 145G that the redevelopment of brownfield land within the Greenbelt is not inappropriate development, except where substantial impact upon openness of the Greenbelt is caused. For the impact to be substantial, the change in openness from the current situation would be, need to be very great indeed. That is simply not the case in this instance. Officers suggest that the development proposals would result in unacceptable loss of employment land, contrary to policy E14. Again, this is incorrect. Even ignoring the fact that the proposals include employment development, which will yield as many, if not more jobs than the existing, policy E14 is clear that loss of employment land uses is acceptable, where the overall benefit to the community outweighs any adverse effect on employment opportunities and the range of available employment land and premises. It is a fact that Harston is extremely well served by existing employment sites within the village framework, more than I mentioned at Power 67 of the officer report. At the same time, there's a significant deficit of affordable housing in Harston and the development proposals will make a substantial contribution to meeting this need, providing a hugely significant community benefit. In addition, you've seen that the parish council is strongly supportive of this scheme. I cannot think of a better barometer of community benefit. Officers suggest that it will be less than substantial harm caused to undesignated heritage assets in the area, being the former station house and the remnants of historic earthworks. The officer report alleges that both features are de facto undesignated heritage assets and states that the scheme causes harm to both. However, a paragraph 15 of the report where the conservation officer's comments are set out, it is clearly stated that the setting of the station house can adequately be preserved by appropriate scheme design or reserves matters. And there's also uncertainty as to whether in fact the earthworks are capable of being considered to be non-designated heritage assets. Perhaps more importantly, the balancing exercise required by Power 197 of the MPPF has not been carried out. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak and I hope members will see the significant benefit of this scheme and, will, and I hope that you will vote to support the proposals. All right, thank you very much. Um, Points of clarification, members, Councillor Haylings. Hello, yes. Um, even though this is a brownfield site, it is within um, the green belt, as you've said, and you, you've been talking about it being purely about judgment. But I would say we have one very, very strong policy, which is about outweighing harms um, in the green belt, is that it's an exception site. And when we're putting forward the arguments for affordable housing specifically to meet local and district need, 
exception sites like this are 100%, whereas you are putting forward what is a normal, um, you know, market application for what is normally within the village development framework and not in the green belt for 40% affordable housing. Can you explain why you're not putting this forward as would be policy compliant for an exception site? And as the affordable housing officer has mentioned in the report, which you didn't make any reference to in your three minutes. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I can clarify. Well, within the, within the report, um, it was noted that what the um, affordable housing officer said was incorrect in terms of this having to be an application for an, an exception site for this to be acceptable. Uh, it's perfect, perfectly within uh, planning means to be able to put a, a market compliant assessment with affordable housing site on a previously developed brownfield site within the green belt, which we are doing, and we feel given that and. Um, increasing and changing the employment uh, capability on the site together with um, together with the affordable housing remit in Harston, which is completely surrounded by Greenbelt, um, that we feel that that is bringing together impact, uh, which bring all positive um, uh, benefits together with the possibility of some um, open market housing as well. Chair, can I just ask a further? Do you want to come back on that? Yes, yes thank you. Is, no, thank you. And so you mentioned uh, we have had cases like this in the past where a viability assessment has shown that it's not possible to meet the 100% requirement for affordable housing and recognising that Harston does have a housing need for affordable housing. Um, and so I didn't see mention of the viability assessment that would say that it would need to be a, a, a traditional 40% affordable yeah. housing. Um, no, the vibe assessment isn't done in, in that regard, but it is um, what we've looked at is um, the housing mix and bringing forward um, uh, smaller uh, smaller dwellings, which are more beneficial to um, the population of Harston rather than in other recent uh, applications um, on land within Harston that have gone for large five, six detached bedroom houses. We have done a, uh, a sensible mix that is compliant with um, officers and through um, having those conversations. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I've got Councillor Khan, please. Thank you. Um, two things really. I wanted to ask you, uh, first of all, uh, what um, what precautions you've taken to cater for the noise problem uh, issue? Um, I know that being close to a, a railway line, it's a quite severe noise impact if you're as close as these houses are being proposed. I realise the uh, level suggested is too high. Um, how do you uh, how do you how do you anticipate making the houses uh, habitable? Um, I can speak from experience on that. I actually worked for a few years right next to the railway line and, and I know the impact. Uh, the um, second, second thing is that what, what, how do you, um, is there any public transport passing by the rail, uh, the housing development? It is at some distance from the village of Harston with separate open space countryside between it and the, uh, the nearest uh, part of the village envelope, uh, the village perimeter. Um, is there any public transport uh, apart from rail line which is on the site of a station which closed in 1963 so it's unlikely to be reopened? Is there any public transport? Because if there's going to be um, affordable housing there, it needs to have good accessibility uh, in other means than, uh, than car transport. Um, sure, uh, um, thank you. I'll, I'll deal with those in reverse order if that's okay. Um, there is um, the public bus stop is um, a couple of hundred meters back up Station Road. Um, and in terms of sustainability, your your two three hundred meters walk from from the local school and all of the various services that are there in Harston, um, including shops, etc. Um, in regards to the noise, we have um, we have liaised with the EHO in this in this matter, um, and there are no objections raised in terms of um, noise from the railway. Um, there will be various. Um, mitigation measures that will be in place and will come through through reserve matters and that's including noise buffering on, on the railway and um, planting and obviously appropriate appropriate materials being used in construction. All right, thank you. Uh, are you is that answer your question, Councillor Khan? Yes, all right. OK, we'll move on then to Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. 
Um, Mr. Adams, I think you have heard uh, concerns from the neighbour regarding um, the issues of the trees along the border. Um, can you tell us if you have considered this, how you see yourself being able to um, remove the planes without damaging the, uh, the roots of the trees? Because I think it's a valid concern, obviously, if you're going to be doing that. And also, for me, the fact that a lot of the canopy, uh, there's a lot of overhang from those trees into the application site, in some ways does reduce what you have available for those uh, buildings. So if you're having to spend more uh, to remedy all that, how will that affect the provision that you are now agreeing to or proposing for affordable housing? Yeah, OK, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Just in, in answer to that, um, a tree survey was um, carried out and submitted as part of the application, and this was um, updated following concerns that were, were raised by um, Tip Toff's house. Um, the, the tree officer initially had some concerns and um, following on from the additional information that was submitted, um, they did remove any holding objection in, in that regard. Um, it's, it's important to note that it is an, uh, an iterative design at the moment, and this is outlined. Um, we feel and our tree consultants um, uh, share the same view that would be absolutely no issue um, with um, coming across to be able to uh, remove that plinth or to be able to use engineering designs to not cause harm to the trees. And in terms of canopying, um, in terms of the garden design, that is a simple measure of just some formal cutting back that would that would need to be um, uh, taken forward. Can I come back on that, please, yeah, Chair? Yeah, come back. Uh, you say simple cutting back. Uh, can you give us an idea just how much overhang there is in terms of, you know, meters and how much cutting back will be required? Because again, uh, too much cutting back could damage those trees, couldn't they? Yeah, I mean, um, some of them are rather large trees. Some of them aren't of particularly good quality, uh, and actually, some some uh, lopping and cutting back. Um, it would be beneficial in that regard um, and the tree officer has agreed in, in terms of our tree consultant as well that there wouldn't be any long-term damage in, in that regard and in terms of cost um, that's not something that would have a massive impact in terms of in terms of viability. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Wright please. Thank you Chairman. Um, my, my issues are the affordable housing, which is largely what this site is being sold on. And going back to Councillor Hayling's point around about the viability study, looking at this site, and I've got a picture of it in front of me, there are substantial buildings on the site, a lot of hard, uh, hard covering on the ground. The, the viability is going to be seriously affected by the amount of work you have to do to clear the site, not mentioning that one of the um, businesses on the site is an attorney is selling roofing and you know has a turn it which is asbestos so you know by the time you've cleared this site up the viability is going to be very very seriously challenged and i really doubt if you're going to make the 40 percent or anything like it perhaps you could comment yeah, um, just in, in return to the comment for that and probably following on from previous councillors' comments, I think part of the reason um, why the site wouldn't work as a full exception site is for that basis that we do realise there has to be some demolition and um, and site clearance. Um, uh, we propose that that, that that this wasn't wouldn't cause an impact on viability in terms of trying to reduce the affordable housing element on the scheme um, and that that would be able to be taken into account by the fact that there will be some market housing on the site um, and that would be taken into account and brought forward as part of any viability concerns um, which we propose there wouldn't be um, going forward by by the, uh, the reserve matter stage. All right, thank you. And Councillor Bradman, do you have a? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to ask Mr Adams, um, whilst we have a report from the trees officer, it simply deals with the canopies. It doesn't refer specifically um, to the removal of the concrete plinth, uh, which the um, parish council, uh, the, the, uh, the gentleman who spoke on behalf of Tiptoft's house, 
mentioned. And it's not clear to me that the trees officer was entirely aware of that when they made their report. Um, as I say, their report only deals with the um, canopy. Well, oh, did that, you, I mean, that, is, that's what, not a question from Mr. Adams, is it? Sorry, that's a uh, question uh, of the officer. OK, fair enough. I'll ask that question um, of the officer. If I could just I could just clarify that the updated um, comments from the tree officer were on the off the back of um, additional um, material we put in following on from the objection from Tiptoff's house on those concerns. So the officer either considered, I, I believe that that was of not a uh, high enough importance to raise further concerns on um, because we feel that it could be addressed from standard engineering design and the fact that um, this is a indicative layout currently which then can be looked at in more detail reserve matters right thank you, thank you very much well thank you mr adams i think that's all the questions from members thank you thanks for your time uh we move on then to the parish council representative is uh councillor o'breen with us please yes can you hear me yes i can hear you okay, Can't that's I'll fine see you as well now um so good what, afternoon chair ladies and gentlemen before you start uh, yeah uh, just as a procedural matter i have to confirm that you have the permission of your parish council to speak on their behalf yes this was agreed at the parish council meeting on the 3rd of september lovely thank you very much so it's uh, three minutes and so whenever you're ready okay um, as I said, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Niall O'Burn. I'm Chair of Harston Parish Council. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes to explain why Harston Parish Council strongly supports this development and would like it to take place. Uh, let me return to uh, uh, Karen Pell Coggins's photos, and I would underline, underline to you that this is a brownfield site, although it li lies within the green belt. Harston has a need for affordable housing. Um, South Council District Council's uh, Affordable Homes Department states that we have a need for 21, and the six in this development would make an appreciable contribution to that need. As has been mentioned, Harston is tightly surrounded by the green belt and over the years it has been virtually impossible to find building land in the village for affordable house building. Let me mention in passing that we have not built, built a council house in the village for over 40 years and none are currently planned. In terms of living in Harston, this site has several, several desirable features. It is within 200 metres of the local primary school, a safe walk along the pavement in Station Road for children. The co-op plans to open a small supermarket next to the school, providing shopping at a walkable distance. And the bus stops on Harston High Street for the number uh, 915 bus are about 300 metres away. So these facets will help to keep people out of their cars and looking further to the future, there is potential. We're about to bid um, for funds uh, to do a, a study on the reopening of Harston Station nearby, which would offer further non-car transport links. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to briefly mention that in spite of having asked, I have been unable to have a dialogue with South Cam's District Council planning about affordable housing in Harston. I wanted to propose that a holistic view be taken of our needs for affordable housing and to replace this particular potential development within that context. That hasn't happened. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Mr. Green. Um, any questions, members? I can't see anything coming up. So no, thank you very much then. That's thank you, Mr. Green. We'll move on then to uh, local member, uh, Councillor Solom. Councillor Solom, are you with us? Oh yes, good. Okay. Thanks, Chair. When you're ready. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm really here today. I, I am here to support this outline application, but it 
it's really more important to emphasise that I'm here in support of the parish council who you've just heard from and the community that we represent. There are clear trade-offs in this application and, and legitimate concerns about the potential harm to the Green Bay Belt, about the potential loss of employment site, uh, we've heard from the neighbours on the on the tree issue, and the benefit to Harston is the is the other side of the trade off. Making those trade offs is obviously the judgment call that you have to make today. But it's my view, and it's one that I share with the parish council, that the benefit does outweigh the harm. Um, Harston has the need for affordable housing, but it's been very hard to get that built within the village framework and with Harston being so tightly constrained by the Greenbelt. Um, this is a site that can actually finally deliver an affordable housing contribution to, to Harston and it, it is much needed. Um, now we do need to proceed with great care with any developments in the Greenbelt, um, but this is a substantial brownfield site and a development of 16 houses doesn't need to cause a great increase in harm to the Greenbelt beyond what is already there. It's true that it's important to get the details right to make sure that that is actually the case, that it doesn't cause harm, but this is an outline application and I, I personally don't see any reason why those details can't be addressed in the usual way they would in taking an outline approval through to, through to development. Um, similarly, the, the, I don't see the trade-off on the employment site is, is, is sufficient to outweigh the benefit. So I'm not going to labour the point any further. You've heard, heard it from me, you've heard it from the parish council. council. Um, but I do hope that you will take our views seriously in your deliberations today and, and vote in favour of approval. Thanks. thanks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, any points of clarification, members? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yep. Yeah. Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I can I just ask um, Councillor Solemn to, to to clarify whether his position is he's supporting this really only because of the affordable housing element to it? I'm just trying to get into my head the arguments we've heard earlier about the viability of of it. So is it the case that you really are supporting this only because of the affordable housing? That that's the key element for you. Uh, certainly, that that is that is the the, the driving driving element for you and uh, for, for for me rather. Right? Um, but uh, uh, and and I think it's it's absolutely right that you you consider the the viability element within within that. Um, I I am not a, a, a planning expert, nor do I I, I pretend to be so and. I am not sitting on the planning committee hearing hearing these uh, all the time, but I think the so the sense I get from the community in Harston is that the the need is is to the extent that they 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 are desperate for any affordable contribution, and that that is a, an important. Uh, it's the most important factor in my, my consideration of supporting this. And I think I, it, to me, it represents an appropriate scale of develop, scale of development on what is a brown field site in the in the green belt. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I don't have any further speakers uh, questioning yet. So, Councillor Solomon, thank you very much. Right, just before we move to the debate, I see that Councillor Bradnam would like to ask the case officer a question. Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've got two. Um, one was that whilst we've heard from the agent for the neighbour at Tiptofts, I couldn't see any representation from the neighbour in our report. Uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but it, uh, I just wanted to check whether any written representation was made that has been incorporated. Um, the second one was that I was concerned that the tree officer didn't mention this um, existence of the plinth. The tree officer only appeared to refer 
to the canopy and I just wanted to check whether the tree officer was aware of that matter about the plinth. Uh, I think those are the questions I would like for clarification. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Councillor Bradnam. Um, with regards to the additional information that was submitted to address the concerns from Tip Top's house, um, that was consulted, uh, the tree officer was consulted on that information and obviously came back with the comments that are actually in the report. Um, with regards to Tip Top's house, yeah, that representation should be noted in the report. It's not specifically under an address. Mm. but it's within the representation section. OK, sorry, I missed that then. OK, maybe it was well hidden. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, thank you. OK, members, and we're open for debates. Um, I see uh, Councillor Roberts, please. You're going to open it. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. It, it's been a very interesting discussion and a lot of information to take on board and a lot of different perspectives. However, um, I am going to go back to the basics really here and, and the, the policy of the green belt. And I think when we were talking earlier about Impington and uh, Councillor Bradnam reminded us about the hospice, uh, where they were clearly um, easily available um, for us to decide that uh, there were exceptional reasons um, to go with a, an application. We saw it with Impington this morning. When I've been listening to the whole discussion this morning, I've had no indication whatsoever that there are, for this type of application, exceptional circumstances. It would have been absolutely different. My feelings would have been absolutely the opposite had it been going to be an exception site with 100% for affordable housing. I think there is an argument in the village uh, clearly um, being discussed about the, the lack of this type of housing for local people. However, this is not going to provide it. Um, we haven't really had a serious reason why that hasn't been considered. I think that the, uh, the officer um, doing this application has come up with absolutely the right recommendation for us, which is for a refusal. And um, I will be supporting the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Councillor. Um, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so I'm going to refer to my notes I've made from the, the speakers through, through the um, representations that have been made because I think a lot of us do do identify um, with the affordable housing issue that a lot of our villagers face. And some of the words that were used were need and, and desperate for affordable housing. It's been hard to find sites um, and that you know, viability is an, an issue. And I can understand why feeling that way, um, and as was referenced by the local member desperation would would lead to supporting anything that came came their way to provide it however i do think that i would be doing a, a disservice because it's so hard to find sites and i've listened to that very carefully that this is the exact situation where the exception site policy is there for because if we do find a site where there can be affordable housing it's our responsibility to make sure we get the maximum amount possible of affordable housing in that area. And 40% just is not enough. Harston needs more and therefore it needs an exception site. And the special circumstances have not been identified as to why that this application before us should be supported. Um, and you know we would have the viability assessment if it came forward as an exception site the viability could show if only 40 percent could be delivered but let's try and make the most of it and i'd encourage the parish council to try and have those conversations with housing officers because they do they are right they deserve more affordable housing um but i'm afraid that this development in its current way is not the way to achieve it you need more and you could get more through a different route and so I will be supporting the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Chairman. 
All right, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I, I, I'm. I remain uh, unconvinced by the dem well, not not unconvinced by the need in the village. I appreciate that, but um, as others have said, I think if that is the case, it should follow the rules for an exception site, and it should offer 100% affordable housing. Um, secondly, I'm concerned that this in no way reflects our normal approach to village approaches. In other words, um, when we come in from the countryside, we do not expect to see a big long terrace of houses right on the outside of the village. We expect a gradual uh, approach to development um, as you go in towards the village edge. Uh, and although this does have an existing Leyland EI hedge in front of it, um, I, I don't think that reflects the spirit of the um, intention of our of our principles around development. Um, and also, I'm concerned that we've got no um, evidence of any kind of search for sites within the village prior to the bringing forward of this. I appreciate the local member has said there has been um, search for sites, but we didn't see any evidence of that. And I think if we had had that evidence, we might have looked upon this application or sorry, I can't speak for others, but I would have looked upon this um, more favourably. But at present, um, I'm still interested to hear the remainder of the debate because I can see a number of people have asked to speak, but I'm, I'm not feeling very favourable towards it at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. And next speaker is Councillor Wright, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm really concerned about this application as well. I think the officer has got it spot on. There are clear objections from the landscape officer. There's, I see it there's harm to the green belt. The design, urban design officer objecting, the historic building officers objecting, and there's also objections from network rail. Uh, this is an outline application, and I note that the contamination officer has only done, there's only been a a brief survey, but not the detailed survey that would, in my mind, with the demolition works needed on the site, which will remove the uh, well, the 40 percent affordable housing because of the viability argument. So to me, this is an absolute non runner. And I think the officer's recommendation is correct. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. And next speaker is Councillor Khan. Councillor Khan, please. Khan, please. <laughs> Sorry, I did. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to say, come come back to the position uh, that I talked about earlier on. This site lies right next door to a railway line, very close. Um, I spent uh, two years doing my research when I, for for a doctorate, working within about the. The similar sort of distance from a railway line in a field in North Wales. Uh, and I remember the impact of having a train running at high speed past you uh, are very close. It, it's, it's, a, it's not just the noise level, it's the shock level because it's a sudden arrival. Uh, and it really would mean that you are putting uh, housing um, in an unsatisfactory situation for, for convenience. It might meet the official requirements, but it won't be very unpleasant to live in. Uh, uh, and your thought, the, the area, I, I don't see this as a satisfactory solution for um, affordable housing or any other housing. Secondly, in terms of distance, it is actually, I, I did a little me measurement on the uh, satellite map and it's about 500 metres from the local school and from the main road in, in, in Harston. It's, it's a bit further and there's 100 metres depth in the actual site. So people at the end of the site will be quite a long way away from public transport. Um, uh, perhaps further than desirable. Uh, thirdly, in terms of openness, the largest houses are put at the far back end of the site. This is beyond the actual back uh, of the gardens of the, uh, the, the properties at Treetops and the station house um, along the main uh, the road. Uh, I might have viewed it a little bit differently, though probably uh, wouldn't change my opinion, if it had only gone uh, to the depth of the existing uh, properties uh, uh, along the along the road, but this goes right down, uh, and the largest houses are the give the most impact in the openness of the green belt. I think it is a major, it is a significant impact on the openness. 
and therefore, um, in addition to the other aspects that have been talked about, I think the pressure towards uh, for, for affordable housing is, 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 is laudable, but this is not the site. Um, it would be much better now in the process of uh, local plan um, making to look to see if a site can be found adjacent to the village uh, perimeter for an exception site, rather than going at some distance from the village in an isolated site, not terribly convenient for, for affordable housing, and with the risk, as Councillor Wright has said, of it not actually being viable in, in the final uh, analysis. So I shall be supporting the officer's uh, recommendation for refusal. All right, thank you very much for that. I've got three more speakers um, and I'd like to draw it to a close then. I've, I haven't heard anybody speaking against the officer's recommendation. So uh, if we can move fairly swiftly, the next speaker is Councillor Halings, please. Yes, and I'd just like to address um, sort of my comments to the presentation made by the Chair of Parish Councillor, Councillor Byron, and completely understand um, the need and desire for the affordable housing. And this coming forward at outline planning um, stage is exactly where we set the parameters for this. And I think whether or not this is the site to have affordable housing or any kind of housing at all is, is still up for debate. But I think you are absolutely right. Seek to have the conversations with affordable housing and under the terms of a viability analysis, work out if you can get um, as much of the affordable housing as necessary. But my, my what I'm really reading into the report is not just about harm and benefit in terms of the open countryside, which is one of the, the concerns, but we've also heard this is a brownfield site, which is particularly, you know, it's not very attractive itself at the moment. I'm also looking at what type of housing and what kind of placemaking we're doing when all of those who know about housing are saying this would lead to very, very dense and cramped housing. So even if we want affordable housing, we want that of, of such a style that it would be, um, you know, good um, quality of life for everybody or whatever the type of housing it is. And so I'm really leaning forward to the fact that we're hearing that that number of housing is too dense for this site for lots of reasons. And that when you look at the viability analysis, there is the possibility to get more affordable housing, which is what should happen in a site of this nature. And there's, there's still a bit to run on this. Um, and I do hope that you can you can have conversations with the affordable housing officers. But at the moment, as, as with others, I'm I'm leaning to um, you know, to not support this application. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank, thank you, Chair. I'll keep my keep my comments brief um, because I'm going to agree with a lot of what's already been said. I'll, I'll just say that I'm a member for um, a neighbouring village to Harston. Um, Newton was, is within my ward. Um, um, I, I agree about the, the, the problems of um, note the objection of the urban design officer. Uh, I think there would be an impact. I agree with Councillor Khan on the openness of the Greenbelt, given the narrowness of the site and the number of houses. I think, as Councillor Halings has just said, it, it could result in a rather dense and cramped developments. So I think um, th those areas are, um, are of concern to me with the Greenbelt. In terms of the affordable housing, I, I completely understand, as I say, as a neighbouring member, I was a member for a neighbouring ward, I completely understand the, the acute need for affordable housing um, in the area, um, but it, it does worry me that this has not been brought forward as, as, an, as an exception site, therefore there hasn't been the proper viability assessment. Um, and it is usual, there are current applications very nearby to this site, not in this ward, um, but there are other applications that are 100% affordable housing um, as exception sites. Um, and I think this should have been brought forward as an exception site so we could have a proper viability um, review. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. And finally, Councillor Harvey, please. Yeah. Yes, just to say I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with the site and I, I've I sort of stood at the entrance and, and within the site a few times and I just attest to the fact that it, it really feels it's a sort of open sky kind of aspect that, that really at the moment does feel very much detached from the village itself and I agree with uh, Councillor Bradnam's comments that it, it, it would seem to me rather incongruous um, in that position in, in relation to the village and I just feel there are too many um, other problems which uh, other people refer to that the, the trees, the fact that 
uh, it's so close to the train line um, and, and the viability uh, we should really be aiming for um, much more affordable housing if we're going to overcome those other problems. So I just feel on balance um, it, it's not the right place. OK, thank you very much. All right, so the I'm going to uh, wind this up now and go for a vote. Um, the recommendation before you is delegated refusal subject to no issues being raised during the amended consultation period. So I haven't heard anybody speaking uh, for approval. So can I take this by affirmation? Agreed. 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 Anybody Agreed. Against? Chair, I'd like to abstain, please. All right. Councillor Hawkins. <laughs> Right, one abstention, 10 approve, uh, 10 in favour of the recommendation. Yeah. Therefore, there's delegated refusal. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move on to next item. Next item is item eight, which has been deferred at Long Stanton. So we now move to Willingham. Chairman, could we yes. request a brief pause? Time are we? Yes, by all means. Uh, 10 minutes uh, or nine minutes, shall we say, back at 12.50. Thank you. Thank you. Is that all right? Thank you. Thank you. Right, Willingham. Isn't Willingham deferred as well? No, no let's back on again. On again. We're on nine.
Aaron, are you there? Hello? Are you asking for Aaron or Karen? Oh, sorry, I was asking for Aaron. I just wanted to check that the live feed was cut. OK, I'll go away. Thanks. He did. Uh, he did confirm that, Chris. OK, thank you. I was just getting an indication that it may not be the case, so um, oh, okay. everyone could just bear that in mind just in case, please. Thank you. OK, noted. Thank you. Um, Chair, can I just let you know that it's Councillor Bradnam here. Yeah. I'll have to leave just before four o'clock, so I'll I'll That's give an indication in chat if I have to do that. Well, I hope we'll be finished long before four o'clock. Let's hope so. Fingers crossed. Hi Aaron, one minute ago on my clock. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> got my headphones on the floor. I'll be back on stream.
John, can I ask you while we're still seemingly off, what time are you thinking about for lunch? Sorry, Chair, you're, you're back online now. All right, sorry. Sorry, we're going. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome back to South Cam's District Council Planning Committee. Um, we're now on agenda item nine, page 321 of our papers. Um, and we're at Willingham. This is reference S0123 stroke 20 stroke FL. And it's at 130 Rampton Road, Cambridge. The proposal is the erection of a five bedroom house and a one bedroom an ancillary an annex with associated parking. The applicant is Mr. and Mrs. Webster. The case officer will take us through the key material considerations. We visited the site yesterday. Uh, it, is a, it is a departure application. Uh, and it's brought to the committee because the parish council requested it. The officer recommendation is for approval. Uh, the presenting officer is Luke Simpson. Uh, if you'd like to give your presentation, please, Luke. Hello, Chair. Uh, can you? Yes, can I can you see. Yeah, hear you and see the screen. Okay, I'm just trying to. Um, Play the presentation so that you can't see my notes. Can you confirm that you can't see the notes? No, we can still see the notes. Okay. Let me try that again. Please bear with me. Apologies, please bear with me. We can still see the notes. Right. Ah, this is a real problem. Does it matter if we can see the notes? Um, Just press on. It, would it help if you just went into slideshow? Yes, I have gone into slideshow. There's, I have this problem regularly when I'm at committee. Sometimes it doesn't uh, just share the slideshow. Um, sometimes it shares the whole um, PowerPoint, including the notes, which okay. isn't particularly helpful because you can't see the plans properly. Um, just let me keep trying. Sorry. Right, is that any better? Yes, that's fine. That's okay. Brilliant. Brilliant. Sorry about that. Um, OK, as the chair described, the site is located at 130 uh, Ram Rampton Road, Willingham. Um, the proposal is for the erection of a five bedroom house and one bedroom ancillary annex with associated parking. Um, as you're likely aware, the application was reported to Planning Committee on 22nd of July 2020. The committee deferred the application to allow the senior planning lawyer to consider the legal arguments made at that committee meeting and the verdict reached in the case of Mansell v Tombridge and Malling Borough Council 2017, um, such that he is able to advise the committee today um, and the other reason the item was deferred was to enable a site visit, which, as the chair uh, pointed out, took place yesterday. So we, we've been through this presentation before, but I'm going through it again. Um, I know that some of the members, or at least one, wasn't at that meeting previously. Um, this slide shows the, the extent of the application site. 
so the framework boundary actually um, falls about here. It, I hope, hopefully you can see the pointer uh, towards the rear of 130 Rampton Road. So the, the village framework is along this line here. And this is an aerial photograph of the site. Um, as you can see, there's a proliferation of development to the rear of properties on Rampton Road. Um, what this photo doesn't show, as members will have appreciated at the site visit yesterday, is the two uh, consented dwellings, which is substantially complete either side um, of the application site. Uh, one at uh, 132 Rampton Road and the other at 124 Rampton Road. So this aerial image, although useful, isn't particularly well, it's not up to date, um, as members will have appreciated yesterday. Um, as you probably are already aware, the applicant already has consent um, under application reference S slash 40, 70 slash 18 slash FL. Uh, that consent remains extant and development must commence before 28th of March 2022. Um, this slide shows the existing consented development on the right. So this is the dwelling they already have um, planning permission for. And the slide also shows the currently proposed layout on the left. Uh, this includes the proposed annex. The footprint of the dwelling would increase slightly, but this would primarily be at single storey level. So these two components um, to the east of the dwelling. Um, but it, you, the location and footprint are similar to that of the currently consented dwelling. Uh, the plan also shows the change in circumstances since the grant of the previous planning permission and shows the two dwellings which I referred to earlier either side of the application site. To the west um, at 124 Rampton Road is a large two storey dwelling. This dwelling is uh, currently under construction. Members will have noted it's substantially complete yesterday. Uh, to the northeast is another two storey dwelling, which is also substantially complete. Um, so that plan's quite useful in showing the, the proposed dwelling in context. These plans show the proposed elevations and floor plans of the proposed dwelling. Notably, whilst this is a two storey dwelling, it is no higher than the currently approved uh, 1.5 storey dwelling in terms of the maximum ridge height. Uh, the appearance would be relatively traditional with brickwork and a range of tiled pitch roofs proposed. Now these are the currently approved plans. So if I flick back, this is proposed. This is already approved. So just by way of comparison, and as you can see, um, the 1.5 stories, the ridge height is approximately 8.3 meters uh, to provide living space at first floor level. So I think there's been quite a bit of correspondence about the dwelling being single story, but it's uh, I think it's an 8.3 meter ridge height and I'd, I'd probably describe this dwelling, dwelling as a 1.5 storey dwelling. Uh, that's what they've already got consent for. So you need to bear that in mind in, in coming to your conclusions today. This slide shows the currently proposed elevations for the annex, um, which is proposed between the existing dwelling and the main dwelling. Um, this annex would serve the proposed dwelling and we would condition uh, the annex to ensure that it's only used for purposes ancillary to the main dwelling um, such that it couldn't be converted to a separate dwelling house without the benefit of planning permission. I should also point out that it appears that the north and south elevations are incorrectly labelled and should be swapped. 
So the elevation at the top left of the screen should state north and and that below should state south. Um, I ask that members please allow officers to address this discrepancy under delegate powers if you are minded to approve the application today. Uh, just to also point out, I don't think anyone, well, no one would be prejudiced by that because both of these elevations, are, well, firstly, it's a single story building, and, and secondly, both elevations have windows in them. So it's not like there, there would be additional windows as a result. Um, we're just talking about the labelling of these two um, components of the plan. These photos show the site to the north and the mobile home which is consented um, which will be removed um, as will be required by planning condition prior to first occupation of the new dwelling if approved so this is this photo is, yeah towards the rear so, so this ground on site yesterday you'll, you'll note that that's the location of the proposed dwelling this slide shows the existing access. Uh, there's a gravel drive to the front of the existing dwelling. Um, there's an existing detached triple garage which will be retained. Um, as you can see, the existing dwelling at 130 Rampton Road, which is here, is a re relatively substantial two story dwelling with a traditional uh, appearance in comparison to more contemporary designs approved either side more recently so it's, the character is quite mixed in this area by way of providing some context for the decision today this is the dwelling approved at reserve matters last year at 124 rampton road um, as was shown on the earlier site layout plan so the neighboring site um, to the west as you'll note this is a large two-story dwelling with a more contemporary design so it's quite substantial. Uh, this is the two storey dwelling approved to the northeast of the application site to the rear of 132, the neighbours. Uh, again, more contemporary design, two storeys, um, substantially complete, as you'll have noted on site yesterday. OK, so since the previous planning committee, uh, Fuse Lane Consortium Limited have made a number of representations to the council's legal officer in relation to this application. I'll therefore uh, seek to address these primary issues insofar as they relate to planning matters. I think Stephen Reid will address the case law, which was previously referred to by Mr Fulton and was one of the two reasons for the previous item being deferred. Um, by way of background, on 7th of September, members will have received copies of, of the correspondence between Mr. Reid and Mr. Fulton, uh, which primarily re primarily relates to legal matters deriving from the previous planning committee. Uh, members will recall that the item was deferred in part to allow Mr. Reid to review the case law referred to by Mr. Fulton. These emails and letters were all sent to Stephen Reid, and I was not the recipient of the emails. Nonetheless, they have also been circulated to members. Um, in any case, the issues raised by the consortium during the last committee meeting have all been fully addressed in the updated committee report. The reason that the report focuses on the case law referred to in terms of Fuse Lane Consortium's comments is because the previous committee item was deferred partly on the basis of that case law and the need for a view of its contents, content and relevance. The other reason for deferral as cited in the minutes was to allow member site visit. All other matters, including reference to H16, could have actually been addressed on the day. Um, with regard to the three points highlighted in Mr Fulton's email dated 23rd of July, I address these in turn as follows. Mr Fulton states that the officer report relies on three clear errors of law. The first of which he states that uh, the report ignores the key material policy of the development plan policy H16. 
So reference has now been made to policy H16 um, and included in, in the latest version of the committee report. But as I said previously, in any event, had members not deferred the item previously, officers would have displayed that policy on the screen and confirmed that all of the criteria are complied with and addressed in, in the original committee report. So H16 has various criteria for development of residential gardens for dwellings and all of those criteria were already addressed uh, within the previous version of the committee report. But in any case, they've been addressed again and reference has been made to policy H16. So that is a correction which resulted from the submissions of Fuse Lane Consortium Limited. Uh, the second error of law cited by uh, Fuse Lane Consortium Limited is that the officer report misdirects the committee, or the previous officer report uh, misdirects the committee as to the degree to which the application conflicts with the development plan as a whole. Um, the, the degree, as far as I'm concerned, the degree of conflict with the development plan is a matter of planning judgment and the committee reports both sufficiently address any planning, uh, development plan conflicts and they address other material considerations, notwithstanding, of course, the reference to H16, which I've addressed at point one above. I'm satisfied that the committee reports both provide sufficient rationale for reaching a conclusion on the impact of the scheme, which in any case is a matter of planning judgment and not a matter for the courts. Further, in order to appreciate the materiality of the conflict with policy S7, as members will have noted yesterday, a site visit in this instance is actually really important. Turning to the third point, um, th the third error of law cited by Fuse Lane Consortium, um, it was suggested that the officer report or the officer completely misunderstands the nature of the materiality of the fallback position in this case. Um, officers respectfully disagree with Mr Fulton on this point. The fallback position is a material consideration and, and both of the committee reports sufficiently consider the differences between the fallback scheme and the proposed scheme and they reach conclusions as to the overall development plan policy compliance and they both consider other material considerations. So uh, and the only other thing I'd add to that is even where a development is more harmful than a fallback position. So the fallback position in this instance is the extant planning permission. That's what we're talking about when we refer to the fallback position. So even where the currently proposed development is more harmful than that uh, development, the approved development is still capable of meeting the statutory test at section 38.6 of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act. Um, so it's not, it's not the case that if if the development's more harmful than the fallback position, that in some way that directs um, refusal uh, of the scheme. Obviously, what is necessary is to consider compliance with the development plan and all other material considerations, which includes the fallback position as part of the overall planning balance. Anyway, it's a moot point in this case because in this particular instance, the development is not materially more harmful than the fallback position. Uh, having addressed those issues, I now turn to the other key considerations in the consideration of this planning application. So the main issues in considering the determination of this application are as follow. The principle of development, so there is conflict with policy S7 as the site is located or the site for the annex and the um, dwelling are located wholly outside of the development framework of Willingham. However, the existing consent is a fallback position, as I've discussed, and does establish the principle of residential development on this site. Planning officers consider that the proposed revisions to the design and the introduction of an annex would not result in a development which is materially more harmful to the objectives of policy S7. 
and I've explained this in detail in the report. Indeed, it could be considered that the resiting of the dwelling actually results in a less harmful development given that the dwelling would not be in such close proximity to the two uh, recently consented and substantially constructed neighbouring dwellings, which members will have noted um, on site yesterday. So moving the dwelling further away from those dwellings could actually have a beneficial impact in terms of amenity of occupiers of all three of those dwellings. Policy S7 uh, has two aims. The first is to ensure developments located in sustainable locations, right? Well, there's already an approval for a dwelling on this site and therefore there is no more harm to this aim than there would be in a fallback position. Uh, the second aim of policy S7 is to protect the countryside against gradual encroachment. Um, as far as I'm concerned, and my advice to members is that the dwelling is, is in a very similar position to that already approved. Parts of the dwelling uh, would be up to 10 metres further to the south um, when compared to the rear elevation of the approved dwelling. Um, but the two storey element of the proposal is only around five metres further south. Um, so taking these factors into account, Planning officers consider that this would not result in a significant conflict with the aim of policy S7 when considering the fallback position um, of the existing consent. Uh, there are other considerations which I went through last time and I'll, I'll go through them again now. So in terms of character, there are two planning commissions either side of the applicant's garden which establish character of development to the rear. Um, so when I say established character, I'm, ta I'm not talking about principle or um, a precedent. I'm talking about actual character. So what is their design terms? What does it look like? What's on the ground? Um, the proposed development in officer's opinion is in keeping with this character. Uh, the dwellings going from a 1.5 storey dwelling to a two storey dwelling, but there wouldn't be any increase in the maximum ridge height. There would be no adverse impact on amenity subject to conditions and there haven't been any objections from neighbouring properties, which is a very important point um, because you know, that's a key consideration, isn't it? Who is this development going to affect? There haven't been any objections from neighbouring properties. OK, uh, the development would be served by its own independent access from Rampton Road, sufficient parking for the existing dwelling and the approved dwelling is provided on plot uh, and in addition they will retain a triple garage as well but even without that triple garage there's sufficient parking on plot proposed and existing. Um, legal uh, submissions have been received which I've addressed um, from Fuse Lane Consortium Limited, the parish council are objecting and we will hear from them uh, very shortly. Uh, so in conclusion, the development accords with all relevant development plan policies with the exception of local plan policy S7. However, the fallback position is, is a material consideration and planning officers do not consider that the proposed development will result in any significant increased conflict with the purposes of policy S7 than that already approved. Uh, therefore, planning officers recommend that the planning commission should be granted subject to conditions. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> All right, thank you very much for that very full presentation. Um, uh, Councillor Bradman, do you have some points of clarification? Sorry, Chairman. Um, no, I withdraw. All right, thank you very much. Uh, don't have any other members asking for clarification. So in that case, we'll move on to the public speakers. Right, uh, is Mr. Fulton with us, please? Yes, I am. Thank you. Good. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you know the form by yes, now. Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, so um, so you're first. Ready. First of all, I'd like to say reasonable people can disagree on whether or not the planning considerations involved in this application weigh for or against the development. 
Um, but what cannot be disputed is that this application has not been considered in a fair and unbiased manner uh, by the council. I will refer to the officer's report, which you have before you, in particular, uh, paragraph 41, which states that no representations were received in regards to this application. Uh, this statement is false. Uh, written representations were received from the Fuseling Consortium on the 16th of July and the 23rd of July. If anything, the officer's report presented to the committee and published on the council's website misrepresents what was actually said at the last planning committee on the 22nd of, the, of July and misrepresents our written representations that were made on the 23rd of July. It is insufficient. Um, uh, first of all, I'd also like to say that I, I agree with most of what the officer said uh, in his oral updates to the committee today, and I appreciate those points, and I appreciate that he has acknowledged the points that we raised on the 22nd of July. However, it is insufficient for officers uh, to present a written report to the council a week in advance of the meeting that fails to correctly summarize the representations received, um, and then at the meeting to supply the council with new information that they have not had an opportunity to consider um, just before the decision is made. Um, what fairness requires is not a matter of judgment for the discretion of the decision maker. What fairness requires is a question of law that is solely within the jurisdictions of the courts. If the council approves this application today, it will be on the basis of, the, uh, of this meeting and the report that is before the committee. Um, and on that basis, uh, a judicial review proceedings um, will be brought and this case uh, will serve as an abject example in English law of how local authorities should not undertake planning decisions. Uh, I'd just like to say that this process has been unfair to the Willingham Parish Council, to the residents of Willingham, and to the applicant. Um, the applicant has a statutory right to receive a planning decision uh, within the time frame set by law. That has not happened in this case, and that's regrettable. Um, I would encourage the applicant to, to assuming that the application is not approved today, I would encourage the applicant to appeal for non-determination and to get a fair and lawful decision from the planning inspectorate, rather than relying on a decision of this council, which will be unlawful and which will be challenged uh, in the courts. Um, and that, that completes my remarks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> right. Thank you, Mr. Fulton. Uh, any points of clarification, members? No, I don't see any there. So, Mr. Ford, thank you very much for that. Uh, we move on then to uh, the applicants. Uh, is Anna Webster with us, please? Hello, yes, I am. Good. If you'd like to put your camera on then, please. I can't. The camera won't work for some reason. All right, fair enough. We can hear you quite clearly. But you're all still very scary to me, so just bear <laughs> with me. No, right. that's, that's fine. So, so you know, you've got this three three minutes to make your point. So. OK, thank you. I'd like to address some of the points actually raised by the Parish Council. I can't go into every detail because this is now approaching its fourth year of a hard emotional struggle to sort out planning permission to keep my family safe. Firstly, the village envelope. We know the application is outside of the village envelope, but it's along with 100 other houses in Willingham which are also outside the village envelope, including the ones either side of us and the annex that we got permission for 12 years ago. So maybe, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but maybe the village envelope actually serves no purpose and maybe it should be updated, which would save the planning department lots of time and it would save you committee people hundreds of hours. It's just a thought. Mr. Harris said in the original that the original annex should have been taken off the property under the planning permission, he said that the annex was to be removed after Mr. Webster passed away within two months. The actual full planning permission had a clause on it that said the annex could be lived in by any other member of the family, including a gardener or a cook. Not that I have one, um, but it could it would only have to be removed from the property if it wasn't lived in for two months, which up until recently it was lived in. But we are now in the process of taking it down to make way for the house. So hopefully I've cleared that one up. 
Again, the parish council have said the house has been moved further back, um, further back than they would like. But so are the two other houses in which are either side of us. And if it hadn't have been us, if the parish council hadn't objected to ours, it would be our neighbours that were in this position and having to push the house back. It's literally for privacy for all of us. He also, Mr Harris has also given a visible elevation between Mill Road and Rampton Road. Um, I've taken some photos and we've asked for Luke to put these up because my video is not working. But basically we've took these photos from from the actual footpath and you can see from the photos that 124 is going to actually be hiding the house from our from the from the actual footpath. In the actual drawings that Mr Harris has supplied, he's actually on the other side of the field on the right hand side and which is there is no public footpath there. So if you are actually on that side, it's only the farmer that's going to see that. I think that's everything I need to say. Thank you for listening. Right. Thank you very much. Right, members, any points of clarification you'd like to take up with uh, Mrs Webster? Nope. OK, then thank you very much, Mrs Webster, for that. If we can then move on to the parish council's comments. Um, Councillor Harris, please. Is Councillor Harris with us, please? Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Is your um, working? Yes. Sorry, uh, we'd like to see you if possible. Sorry, yes. We, we could before. We could. Yes, yes, I thought you could. Um, I can see me. Yes, uh, there, there we are. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, for procedural matters, I, I have to ask you if you have the permission of your parish council to speak on their behalf. Uh, yes, I do. I know you did at the previous meeting as well. Right, thank, you. thank you very much. So you know, know the uh, drill, you've got three minutes, so whenever you're ready to start. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm representing Willingham Parish Council. This is the third application for this development. Uh, I noticed uh, Mrs Webster has made a comment that it's been going on for five years, but they had outline approval first of all, then an application which has been approved since. The main reason for our objections has been the location of the development. It is well outside the village envelope. Uh, I don't know if Luke can show the information that I supplied, as he did with Anna Webster's. All right, you, you carry on here. Uh, I'll get Luke to look for that. OK, thank you. Uh, can I just make a small point? I, I didn't know that you had visited yesterday. It would have been very nice to have attended that meeting as well. Um, but that's by the by. Um, the first page of the information is the extent of the development. The initial outline application, the 2017 one, um, was uh, well outside the village envelope, which we objected to. Um, the, uh, the, from the original application, the edge of the envelope is some 40 metres or so from the edge of the road. The main dwelling on this application is about 22 metres deep and starts 80 metres outside the village envelope. The back of this dwelling is therefore over 140 metres from the road. Uh, the second page of my application. Uh, so, so the first one was where it shows how the relation to the village envelope. Uh, could you go to the second page, please? Uh, second page shows the original 27 outline, outline application was for a four bedroom two-storey house together with an annex of two semi-detached two-bedroom houses. At this time there is no five-year plan and as such this was approved with condition 8 which states quote the dwelling hereby permitted shall not exceed one storey in height and all accommodation within it shall be on the ground floor only. When a full planning application was made in 2018 this condition was not complied with as the house had one and a half storeys. There are four bedrooms in total, with three bedrooms and two bathrooms on the upper floor, and a single storey bedroom with ensuite facilities added at the side towards the back. And that's the middle application. Um, the annex is not shown on this application. The lines show where this development has extended. 
the overall size of this is about 221 square metres, just under 2,400 square feet. Willingham Parish Council recommended refusal and let it go to committee who was approved under delegated powers. The current, this current application has grown considerably. It is extended another 10 metres or so back and the house is now two storeys high as on the original application. Although it is listed as five bedrooms, the previous ground floor bedroom is now described as a dog room. Also, these five bedrooms and three bathrooms are all up on the upper floor, increasing its visibility considerably. Additionally, the external annex has reappeared, shown as an extra bedroom unit. This is the same footprint as the original four bedroom annex in the outline application. This increased house size has grown from an original approval to 371 square metres, almost 4,000 square metres square feet. Additionally, the detached annex has reappeared, all but shown as a single story with a footprint of 85 square metres. Overall, this has gone to a proposed development of 456 square metres, about 5,000 square feet, twice that of the approved application. The lines again show how further this has gone back into the country. Finally, on page three, can I draw your attention to the difference between the visible elevation from elsewhere in the village? I realise that the photographs taken show that it would be hidden from that viewpoint. That footpath is actually quite long. It shows that the house, on, on, if I have a look at page three, please. It shows the uh, back of the adjacent development, which is actually the single storey part of the nearer house. And you can see how much bigger the whole uh, first floor part of the elevation is. Uh, it is much larger than that originally. Can you draw to a close, please? Uh, yes. Sorry. Good. Um, we feel this application is over development twice as big as that approved. It has also further extended into the countryside and greatly increased its impact on local views, causing additional harm. We are sketching DC to reject this application on these grounds to stop original approvals trying to expand and that this should not become a principle that can be applied to future developments. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. OK, members, any points of clarification you want to raise? I can't see any. No, OK, then. thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you. Right, members, um, we can move on, but just before we do, I just like to check with uh, Mr. Carter if there's any further advice he wants to give us. Not from me, Chair, but I don't know if we'd like to check with Stephen Reed, possibly. <clears throat> right, OK. Um, uh, Mr. Reed, do you have any? Do you wish to? Yes, speak? If, it, yep. if I may, Chair, my camera's not working but hopefully you can hear me yeah we can hear you um it's my understanding from what uh mr fulton uh, was saying is that actually there are um further issues in relation to the uh report which he feels are not accurate uh he said that at paragraph 41, various statements are made, which he says are not true. Um, and uh, he has suggested that uh, judicial review proceedings will be uh, brought arising out of any decision today. There has been lengthy discussion at the start of planning committee as to the ability for anyone to make representations and I would therefore advise members that in my view uh, Hughes Lane Consortium should be making representations such that the matter comes back to uh, uh, committee for further consideration in the light of Mr Fulton's uh, complaints and that uh, the committee has the opportunity to consider those representations rather than to face the issue of judicial review proceedings, which clearly uh, uh, can take into account any further, any 
representations which Mr Fulton wants to make. So um, I would invite Mr Fulton to, to make representations such that the matter does come back to committee and committee can decide that it has a uh, report uh, which stands or not. Thank you. So just to be clear on that, so what, what are you asking us to do now? Are you asking us to defer the thing again or to actually go to a decision and then? Um, no. No, I'm not. I'm not inviting you you to defer. I'm inviting. Oh. Chairman, I've, I I am okay. going to propose a move to defer. No, no, hang on. Wait, wait a minute. Let's try to try and get some sense out of this. Chairman, Mr. Reed, are you still there, or have we lost you all together now? Chairman Luke is signalling he, he really wants to speak. Sorry? Sorry, uh, it's the deputy vice chair. So, Chair, if you'd like, I can read out the people who would like to speak. One of them is the case officer. We've also got. Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people do, but uh, if we're going to defer, we might as we need to get on with it. We've already wasted a, lot, a whole load of time. Do you want to hear first? Wasted back other people's time then. this morning. Uh, Reed and so, then the case officer again who wants to come back. Now I, I want uh, Mr Carter's advice of whether we should defer now or not please. Thank you Chair. Um, in my opinion I think we need to complete the advice that Mr Reed was providing. Uh, I, I don't know if Mr Reed may have just rejoined possibly. Yeah thank you. Right. Shall I take over now Chris? Thank you. Yeah, please. So, so my advice to members of the committee is not to defer. Uh, but if Mr Fulton is minded to issue judicial review proceedings, he should take he should first take advantage of the ability to make further comments uh, during the consultation period, such that those those comments can be reviewed as specific comments. Mr. Mr. Reid, let, let's stop there for the moment, please. I understood that we were told at the beginning of this meeting that the IT issue didn't actually apply to this. Chair, if I may. Yep. Yes, that is correct. Um, so that Mr. doesn't Reed, work. Uh, does. the, there is no further consultation period for this item. So there wouldn't be any further opportunity for Fuse Lane Consulting to make further representations. So given that, Mr. Reid, what's your advice now? Um, uh, uh, my, uh, my my advice is that uh, not notwithstanding that the consultation period has closed, uh, you've been advised that uh, judicial review proceedings will be issued because of inaccuracies in the report. So in those circumstances, uh, it would be my recommendation to defer. Right. Thank you very much. All right, members. Yeah. Regrettably, uh, I don't think we've got any option but actually to defer. So I'm proposing that we defer this to a, a later meeting. Can I have a seconder, please? I'll second it, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Councillor Roberts is seconding. Uh, is this by affirmation or does anyone wish to vote against it? Agreed. Chairman, mm -hmm. I would like to speak to the motion, please. I've indicated so. Oh, okay. Yeah, you've got that. And also the case officer has requested multiple times. Well, it, it, it's probably re not relevant now on that one, I think. Uh, Councillor Williams, you want, to, you want to speak to this? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to clarify something in the report. It says we should have made a decision on the 10th of March. I, if the advice is that we have to defer, I think we ought to be apologising to the applicant because I've had applicants come to me about this and they say that the emotional impact this has is just cruel. And this feels like we've, we're putting them through an awful lot by doing this. I appreciate that might be the legal advice, but we ought to be apologising as well. 
Well, yeah, and other people ought to be apologising as well because it's not us who's created the situation. Okay, so, so, uh, so let's go to a vote then. Chair uh, Luke. Anyone against? Chairman, would it be wise to hear what the case officer has to say? No. Uh, we've heard the legal advice. Thank but, you. No, I, Chair, if I may, I, I think uh, you should hear what the case officer has got to say. Thank you, Mr. Reid. Case officer, what do you have to say to us? Thank you, Chair. I'm surprised you, you know, you didn't want to hear from me. It's essential that I get this point across. Um, representations were sent to Stephen Reid, right, uh, from Daniel Fulton in relation to the uh, case law referred to at the previous committee. Um, the report itself states that no third party representations have been received, but I can correct that now and I've already corrected it because I've already been through all of the representations received. I sent them to members as well. So you've had sight of them. The only error in the report is the fact that, well, it's not even necessarily an error because those um, representations weren't sent directly to me. They were sent to Stephen Reid, but in any case, they have been shared with members and I have covered them in a PowerPoint slide at this meeting. There's absolutely no need to defer this item. Um, absolutely no need. You don't want to get into an argument. Of a, a most it's not an argument, Chair. It's, um, that's We're in, that's yes, my, perhaps in a very difficult position, don't you? Well, let's see. I, I'd like yeah. to see what Mr. Reid has to say off the, off the back yeah. of that, because I'm not sure he was necessarily aware of the basis for a legal challenge and it wouldn't be sensible to defer just because there's a threat of a legal challenge when we don't actually understand what that challenge centers on so that's very important especially given that the applicant has had to wait uh, for this item to be deferred once already mm. um, and i don't want to take the blame for that um, so <laughs> let's, let's, um, Chair, let's, I think let's Carter right. would like to speak as well who oh, sorry yeah, mr carter yeah Please. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to support the comments that Luke has just made. Mr Fulton in his presentation referred to his representations that were submitted. Uh, they were submitted to Stephen Reid. Uh, Luke has referred to them and they were circulated to members uh, before the meeting, so members have had an opportunity to, to consider them. Uh, what's important is that members have that information in front of them uh, at the time that they make a decision. Uh, the fact that it wasn't covered uh, in the report is regrettable, but what is important in terms of the decision making is that members have that information in front of them and they do. Therefore, my opinion would be that we can determine this application today. Uh, that is my advice to you, Chairman. Thank you. All right. Thank Chair, you. if I may. Yes, please. Um, uh, I asked you specifically to allow Mr Simpson to comment following my comments in case he did wish to take a different view to the one I had expressed. I fully support Mr Simpson's comments uh, and I am now suggesting that you do not defer. Uh, uh, the papers circulated to, to members show that Mr Fulton has been invited since the 20 since late July to actually accept that the representations he made to planning committee were not reflected in the uh, Court of Appeal decision. Uh, he's had many, many weeks to say that he take he doesn't agree with that and he hasn't done so. I suggest we get on and determine this matter to, uh, today. Right, OK, members, we have a rather confused uh, set of um, issues there, but now we appear to have come to a clear um, recommendation that we actually proceed with this. So um, in the interest of, of the applicant and that this has been going on forever, 
I think we should proceed to actually uh, deal with this. So we will now go to the debate. Um, can I have people who would like to speak to the debate? We are, we are not debating deferral anymore. We're talking about the uh, coming to a conclusion, please. Uh, do I have speakers, please? Yes, Chair, you have Councillor Khan. Councillor Khan, please. Thank you. Well, I can. <laughs> trouble with the. Ah, oh, sorry, trouble with my unmuting. It's all right, we can hear you. Good. Sorry, Councillor Khan, you're now muted. I think you uh, accidentally muted yourself after. Uh... Didn't... Sorry, I didn't do anything, but I don't know what happened. Uh, never mind. Here we are. If this application had been um, received before the uh, applications uh, for the adjoining properties had been uh, approved, we would uh, certainly have uh, refused it because it's outside the, uh, the, the village perimeter. Now it is, uh, you're talking about developing between two existing developments which have been approved on the site of an existing site um, with a, a very small extension to the rear. When you look on the site, the site visit as uh, the police officer commented was critical in terms of appreciating this site. The, uh, there appears to me, having seen the site, um, the location on site, that there is an improvement despite the increased size of the property uh of the proposal because of the um, increasing distance from adjoining properties particularly on number 130 30 i think 132 uh, um, road uh, where it is very the original proposal was very close to the boundary um uh, within uh prop looks as though it's just about a meter and the new proposal is a consider considerably further distant which would mean that there would be less uh, impact on the immunity uh, for this, so I think the uh, the minimal extension rear um, is countered by the fact that it, there is improved immunity and uh, it's a more desirable development. Uh, so that I, uh, in that sense, I, I feel that um, I shall be supporting the uh, recommendation for appro approval. All right, thank you very much for that. We have Councillor uh, Ripeth. Councillor Ripeth, please. Um. Thank you very much to the case officer for arranging the site visit. I found that particularly helpful. And I too, like Councillor Khan, think that the amenity would actually be improved and um, I will be supporting this application. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you very much. Councillor Williams, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so looking and trying to take everything into consideration on this application, and as I referenced earlier, I really do feel for the applicants in this situation. However, when determining the application, obviously I can't take that into account. Um, and on balance, I'm going to, I'm inclined to vote and refuse of this application on the basis of the impact and character and appearance of the area, which I do believe the Parish Council have um, identified succinctly. And the fact that it is it's further back than previously done, you know, it's just going further and further back. And um, we now have a land supply as well. So we have to take the decision in, in the situation that we are in. We are told we have a land supply. We are determining applications on that basis. Um, and therefore, it's a departure. It's out of policy, policies that I think we really need to hold on to. And I will be voting against. But I do hope that they have resolution soon as applicants. Thank you. Councillor Bradnam. Please. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I. I'm very unhappy about this development uh, for all the reasons that the Parish Council uh, explained. 
Um, and I'm very glad we had a site visit. Thank you very much. I'm glad the deferral gave us time to do that because I think it was important. Um, but what I note is, as others have said, this new proposal is actually further back outside the village framework than the previous proposal. It is bigger in footprint, much bigger than the previous proposal, which was actually quite a modest dwelling at one and a half storeys. Um, and this is much bigger than that. And as the parish council chairman told us, it's twice the size of the original application. And this application has an additional annex. Um, so I, whilst I take the point about uh, buildings developed on either side, I actually think this proposal has a bigger impact on the um, countryside around Willingham than the previously approved application. And so uh, I'm afraid, but I am minded to refuse. Councillor Roberts. Yep, Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I share the concerns um, about the application itself, and I did listen very carefully to the Parish Council's representation, and it seems to be really a question of um, mission creep here um, from what it was originally and the restrictions on the size to a completely different beast now. And I think that um, it is detrimental now. It's become a detrimental application. Um, can I just say as well, I am very concerned uh, and would hope that officers and the chairman, vice chairman would look at this recording again today to see how this has been handled. I think it's disturbing. I think it's not acceptable. I think that we have to question how much um, allowance we will make to officers uh, with their input. I'm All not right. going to say Thank anything you. more. Councillor, yes, I, I agree. Needs consideration. Uh, can rely on the fact that this will be pursued. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor uh, Wright. Wright, is it? Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I too visited the site, having requested the site visit uh, before when it was deferred last time. The site visit to me was particularly important because you can uh, stand back and look at the two developments on each side and view what is coming in relation to those. The damage on this application was done uh, when the three were granted because of the lack of the five year land supply and it was then out of the village framework. So to me that horse has bolted. Um, I have enormous respect, respect for William Parish Council and they are usually right and I really understand their anger on this application. Um, but looking against what is already built on each side of it, this is this is no worse, no better and I am minded to approve it. Thank you, Chairman. All right, thank you very much. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, definitely uh, the site visit was quite uh, important, I think. And in fact, I will not keep you too long because Councillor Wright has pretty much said uh, what I was going to say. If you had seen those two, either side of it, it makes no difference that, you know, this is now going to be a two story rather than a one and a half. The ridge height is still the same. And frankly, you know, the, the, the harm, I don't see the harm or any worsening harm than what has already been done. So my view is I will be supporting this application. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I see, yeah, Councillor Khan's computers crashed. So, um, yeah. Councillor Harvey would like to speak. Yeah, Councillor okay. Harvey, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Chair. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, I. I yeah. um, Anna, could you put, turn your camera off, please? Councillor Chair, can we? Can can we can we hold until Councillor Khan is back on? Otherwise, he's not going to be able to vote. 
I think he must be I've back, on, back on, on because uh, he's given me a message. I've, I've been back on since Councillor Nick Wright uh, was speaking, but I missed Council, what, what Councillor Brandon and Councillor Roberts were saying. I'm sorry. All right. OK, thank you. Noted. Uh, so, sorry, uh, Councillor Harvey. Back yes. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I find myself in a, a slightly awkward position because I, I was um, booked onto the site visit, uh, but because I'm substituting on this occasion, um, it was my understanding, uh, you know, yesterday morning that, that this application would be deferred and therefore I didn't think it was a good use of my time to go on the site visit, given that I wouldn't uh, be part of or unlikely to be yeah. part of the subsequent. Um, so therefore I feel I must abstain because our others have kind of um, attested to the importance of the site visit, which I haven't had the benefit of. Right, thank you very much. Uh, okay. Chair, if I may. Sorry, who's that? It's Mr. Stephen Reid again, Chair. All right. Um, um, Councillor Khan has said that he didn't hear the comments of Councillor Roberts and Bradnam. Bradnam, rather than um, uh, him not being able to vote, can Councillor Roberts and Councillor Bradnam repeat their comments? Oh, yeah. Uh, does Councillor Roberts and Councillor Brednan want to do that? I can quickly reiterate so that yeah, we can... Very shortly, please. OK, yes, please. my point was that um, I felt that the site visit was useful, uh, but this application is still much bigger than the previously approved application. And in fact, it's twice as big in terms of the footprint. I appreciate the ridge height is similar, but the footprint is much bigger. And this application has an additional annex that was not present in the previous application. Whilst I appreciate that 124 and 132 have large um, um, approvals which are being built out now, I still feel that this is being moved back further away from the village, uh, the development framework. And for that reason, I feel it's detrimental and therefore I'm minded to refuse. Right, thank you very much for that. And Councillor Roberts, would you uh, um, see of your <laughs> views? Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Oh dear. It is becoming a bit of a circus today, isn't it? Um, uh, more than a bit of a circus. Um, yeah, I'm, I am against it because I feel it's mission creep. Um, I know what has happened um, to the adjoining properties. However, they were done at a time when we didn't have a control. I think now we do need to realise we have a control and uh, we need to uh, actually uh, implement that control. Uh, where you have a, a house that uh, was um, formulated for a much smaller entity um, and now has doubled up in size, it's mission creep. And I think that we would have this situation all over the district. There comes a time when we have to accept that what was going on before has happened, but what is with us now gives us that control. And I think we ought to be absolutely sticking to that um, uh, uh, ability to, to control our policies. This doesn't fit in with that. And the parish council are quite right to be very concerned about it and to be objecting. And I will be voting against. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. So Councillor Khan, I take it you are still with us and you have heard all that. You just say yes. Yes, that's yes fine. I heard it. <laughs> that's great. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you very much, Chair. I won't, won't keep you very long. Um, just to say I've listened to the debate very, very carefully. Um, I'd like to record my thanks as well um, for the site visit, which I thought was, was really very useful um, in, in, in judging this application. Um, I've listened very carefully to the arguments on either side. Um, I, 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 I must say it, it's not, not a clear cut decision for me. I think on balance, I tend to agree with Councillor Wright, however, that I think the damage was done um, year, many years ago when the first planning application was made and that even though the footprint here is, is larger, I, I'm not sure um, for me that that's sufficient to um, to refuse. I, I'm minded to, to, to vote in favour. All right, thank you very much. Now, Councillor Heather Williams, 
Chairman, you're, I wrote that about because... 20 minutes ago and it's only just come through. I think I have an issue with my chat. So it, it got clarified during the okay, um, right. legal advice earlier. OK, fine. All right. OK, members, let, let's actually bring this to a conclusion then. So uh, obviously there's going to be a, a split vote. I'm taking it that those who want to refuse are doing so on the basis that they feel that this new application uh, causes more harm than the existing uh, approval. Um, there are also issues about it outside of the village envelope and the character the impact on the character of the area. So, uh, and also the additional. Hang on. So who wanted to speak then? Sorry, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Bradham, I wanted to point out it also has an additional annex, which um, was not on the previous approval. Well, all right, that comes into the additional harm, then, doesn't it? OK, fine. Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Roberts, did you want to add something there? Yeah, just chairman that uh, it is con it is outside the village envelope and is contrary to such. Um, and okay. I think we ought to be standing yeah. up. Thank you. So we've got that. So that's um, the basis for any refusals. Um, my own view is that the, the real issue is about the existing application and this one, um, which whatever happens, there is uh, a development going on here, which is the, the doing the least harm. My view is that this one slightly further down is actually less harmful uh, than um, the existing. So I will be voting in favour. We will now have a roll call. So the proposal from the officer is for approval with all the conditions and so on as per the report. So if we can start the round of voting then please. So if you want approval, you vote for. If you want refusal, you vote against and abstain should you wish to abstain. So Councillor Bradnam, please. Against. Against. Uh, Councillor Khan. For. For. Councillor Harvey. Abstain. Abstain. Councillor Hawkins. For. Oh. Councillor Halings. For. Oh. Councillor Ripith. For. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Against. Against. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Against. Against. Richard Williams, please. For. Councillor Wright. Four. Oh, and my own vote is four. So the vote is seven, three and one abstention. So that is approved. OK, thank you very much. Um, it is now just about two o'clock. Um, I suppose that we have a half an hour break for lunch and reassemble at 2.30. Okay, thank you.
Thank you very much, Chair. You're now live again. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to South Cairns District Council Planning Committee. Uh, we are now moving on to agenda item 10. That's on our um, agenda papers at 361. Now, members, you should also have a supplementary uh, set of papers um, entitled Update Report, which is giving the views of um, the Camborne Town Council. So with those papers, we're at um, Camborne. It's uh, reference 20 stroke FUL. This is South Cambridgeshire Hall, Camborne Business Park. The proposal is the provision of carbon reduction emission measures, including a borehole array across the existing car park, ground source heat pump system within the existing building, and provision of a voltovoltaic solar car park ports. So the applicant is South Cairns District Council. The uh, case officer will take us through the key material considerations. Um, the applicant is brought, uh, the application is brought to the committee because the applicant is South Cairns District Council and it's a requirement that all our internal um, applications have to come to this committee. Um, the officers uh, suggestion for is approval and the presenting officer is Luke Simpson. Luke, can you give us your presentation, please? Thank you, Chair. So similarly, I'm going to share the slides and can you confirm that you can see the PowerPoint without the notes? please. Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon again, members. So as the chair explained, the site is South Cambridgeshire Hall, which you'll all be very familiar with. Um, the proposal is the provision of uh, carbon reduction emission measures, including a borehole array across the existing car park, a ground source heat pump system, and provision of photovoltaic solar car ports. Members will have seen the update report which was circulated and that includes a revised list of planning conditions. Uh, it also includes reference to consultation responses from uh, Camborne Town Council and the tree officer. This slide shows the extent of the application site. As you can see from the slide, there's also an area of land to the east of the office building which is proposed as an area for a temporary car park during construction of the solar car ports and borehole array. So this feels to the east of the site. This slide shows that the solar car ports would be located across the central section of the existing car park. So this area here, highlighted in blue. Um, the car ports are uh, sited such that they would not result in the removal of any trees within the car park. Uh, the car ports would incorporate 20 uh, electric vehicle charging points to promote electric vehicle use. Um, the plan also indicates the location of the closed loop borehole array, which will be linked to four pumps within the old server room in the main building. And the borehole array will be entirely below ground. So these blue lines indicate the location of the below ground closed loop borehole array. Um, I know that the agent is going to speak, but I'll try and explain how a ground source heat pump works. So forgive me if I get it slightly wrong. Uh, the ground source heat pump works by pumping cold water underground, which is then heated naturally due to the warmer temperature underground. Um, so the water is circulated in the system and there's no abstraction of water um, because it's a closed loop as opposed to an open loop system. Uh, the heated water is then pumped back up to the pump and evaporates as it cools and creates heat. The aim is to replace the majority of gas used for heating um, and hot water 
within the building. Um, as I said, there's no water abstraction um, and water is circulated through the system. Uh, the development as a whole would reduce the building's annual carbon footprint from over 350,000 kilograms of CO2 a year to approximately 182,000 kilos, uh, in keeping with the Council's commitment to support the transition to net zero carbon. And the panels um, would generate approximately 136 kilowatts of electricity which would meet approximately 20% of the building's uh, peak demand needs. Uh, this plan shows the location of the temporary car park. So clearly the car park will have to be closed or part of the car park will have to be closed um, during the construction period. So the applicant has proposed a temporary car park um, on land within the red line boundary. Um, Notice has been served on the landowner as well. Um, currently, car parking is provided across the site as follows. So there are 227 bays for staff. Uh, there are 13 accessible spaces, 19 car share spaces, and the overflow parking um, along this access road here provides for 34 spaces. So there are 293 spaces in total at the moment. Um, the overflow car share and accessible parking spaces will all be unaffected. So if I just go back a slide. So these spaces uh, and the accessible spaces directly adjacent to the building um, will not be affected. They, they won't need to be closed off. Um, and the Overflow spaces on this road here will also remain during the construction period. Right, if I go back to the parking slide plan. So the, the proposals will result in the overall loss of one parking space. And obviously there aren't any proposals to increase floor space or anything like that. So we, the, the proposals don't result in the increased parking demand, any increased parking demand. I suppose the reason I've dedicated uh, a whole slide to parking is because I obviously having worked at the council, I'm aware of the issues uh, associated with parking um, that can sometimes arise. Um, and that's that's that has formed sort of basis for my initial pre-application advice to um, to the agent in submitting this application. So the car park is likely to be shut for seven weeks for construction to take place. Uh, construction was originally planned for the summer, this summer, um, but there has been a delay in determining this application, uh, unfortunately. However, clearly with the current increase in home working, the impact associated with parking is significantly reduced at this present time. Uh, nonetheless, the applicant has provided uh, or is seeking to provide 135 parking spaces to the east of the main building with obviously the, the 90 spaces I referred to that are unaffected um, remaining as well. So that would bring us to 225 spaces during that, that construction period. Uh, planning officers consider that taking all of that into account, the level of parking provision over the construction period has been sufficiently justified by the applicant and quite a lot of work has gone into making those arrangements. Uh, these are the images uh, of the temporary parking area. So to the right, it's this field adjacent to the building. You'll be familiar probably with the access road. Um, so it wouldn't be difficult for uh, employees to access the building from the temporary car park is only a short distance um, to the main building. Uh, provision will be made for a temporary roadway matting to be laid from the access from this access point to all parking bays, so grass parking mats and reptile fencing will also be erected around the boundary of the temporary parking area. 
this aerial shows the location of the proposed panels and at the bottom of the plan you can see the elevation of the proposed panels as well. So the solar carports would have a mono pitch roof with a maximum height of approximately four metres and a minimum height of 2.5 metres. As you can see, the panels will be located such that there would not be any trees removed either within the car park or along its boundaries. So they're, they're located in the centre of the car park. Um, and the, these, this planting and the planting along the boundaries, which I think is a, a lot more established than shown in this aerial, is, uh, will be retained and there, will, there won't be any trees removed. Uh, as you may be aware, the previous application for solar panels within the car park was refused in 2015 by planning committee. Uh, this was due to the resultant loss of mature landscaping. So the landscaping and planting I've just mentioned along the boundary and within the car park itself. That that previous proposal involved the removal of a lot of that planting. And then uh, we're not satisfied with that. And the, the loss of planting was considered to have an unacceptable visual impact upon the setting of this part of the business park. Um, in addition, the previous refuse scheme proposed canopies all over the car park, so all, all of the parking spaces would have been covered in carports, um, so the visual impact would have been far more prominent. So this scheme has obviously been carefully designed, um, it's much more modest and uh, it does not involve the removal of boundary planting and has a lower visual impact because the planting obviously actually helps screen the uh, the panels from the surrounding area and uh, I should probably say the borehole array itself has also been revised um, to avoid the root protection areas of the trees as recommended by the tree officer who is now in support of the proposals. This slide shows the location of electrical charging points which would be built into the frame of the carports. So the slide shows an elevation as well of the proposed inverters which would take up one parking space. So that's there would be the loss of one space and that would be to the inverters which are required to convert um, AC current, um, sorry DC current to AC current um, to provide electricity to the building. Uh, only one elevation has been um, proposed or, or, or submitted this this elevation here. So um, I would recommend an additional planning condition to those which are set out in the update report um, and the wording of the conditions on the following slide so it, it, I don't know if someone can note down the, word, the proposed wording but uh, we really need to see uh, all elevations of those inverters before you know uh, development commences and I suggest that that information is provided um, and, and considered by the council. Um, prior to commencement of development. So I propose the following wording. Uh, no development shall commence until details of the proposed inverters have been provided to the LPA and approved in writing. The development shall thereafter be undertaken in accordance with those details. And the reason being obviously to ensure that the proposed development is in keeping with the character of the surrounding area in accordance with adopted local plan policy HQ1. So in terms of the key considerations, the principle of development complies with uh, local plan policy CC2 on generating energy from renewable and low carbon sources. It complies with all criteria with the exception of criterion C, which relates to decommissioning. Um, the reason uh, for that criterion is, well, it centres on large scale development or development whose sole function is to provide renewable energy. Um, in this instance, it's not considered um, to be conflicted with, well, it's not considered relevant because of the dual function of the solar panels as carports and providing electrical charging points as opposed to, for example, a solar farm, uh, which would potentially be decommissioned and removed from site after 25 years. These carports will remain in situ indefinitely. Um, so therefore, I don't really, I don't consider that that 
condition is necessary or reasonable really in this instance. Um, should members decide that it is, uh, they can recommend the inclusion of a condition on decommissioning um, after a certain period of time, which could be 25 years. That's that's generally a standard period. Um, so in terms of visual amenity, uh, in comparison to the previously refused scheme, this scheme involves a lower quantum of development. None of the trees or hedgerows in the car park would be damaged or removed as a result of the proposal and the landscape officer is also supportive. Um, in terms of climate change and renewable energy, there are significant benefits associated with the development um, by way of generation of energy from renewable sources, which I mentioned earlier, and obviously the carbon reduction, um, the, the resultant carbon reduction, which I also mentioned earlier. Uh, parking provision, the proposed development doesn't create any increased parking demand and only involves the removal of one space. The temporary measures are all uh, well considered uh, and, and planning officers consider uh, those temporary measures to accommodate the temporary need for alternative parking, particularly in the current climate as well. That's obviously a relevant consideration. Um, in terms of impact on biodiversity, the ecology officer has recommended various conditions which have all been included. These include a condition requiring uh, biodiversity, biodiversity enhancement measures and a condition requiring the submission of a construction ecological management plan. Um, and on that basis, officers consider that the development complies with uh, local plan policy NH1 on biodiversity. Uh, there haven't been any objections. Uh, we've received one letter of support from a local resident um, outlining um, the benefits of this development. Uh, planning officers therefore recommend approval subject to the conditions as set out in the update report. And the additional condition which I highlighted on the slide uh, requiring details of the proposed inverters to be submitted prior to commencement of development. Uh, thank you very much. Right, thank you. Um, just before we proceed further, members, we're coming up to the four hours. We have to agree to uh, continue the meeting. Uh, so I propose that uh, we do continue the meeting. Can I have a seconder for that, please? I'm happy to second. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Bradenham. Uh, anyone against? No, OK, so unfortunately we continue. <laughs> All right, so uh, any points of clarification? For the Councillor Brednan, yep, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to confirm with the case officer that there won't be any legs under the free edges of the um, solar panels, that they'll be co totally cantilevered from the middle. I say this as somebody who has driven my car reversing into a space and hit a pillar. So I just want to check there are no, no legs at the front. All right, thank you. Can you give us that assurance, Luke? Yes, thank you, Councillor. Uh, good question. Uh, the applicant will, well, the applicant's agent will hopefully confirm this, but uh, having looked at the plans, the mounting posts are all in the centre of the carport. Um, I did share a slide, probably wasn't particularly clear, but mm. yes, the, the um, mounting posts are central and that's where the charging points are as well, so there's nothing on the perimeter edge. In that right. in that's reassuring. <laughs> All right, thank you. We Can have a few more. Uh, do you want to just check that they are questions rather than debate? Yeah, questions only for clarification. Councillor Harvey. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, really, a question on uh, climate change mitigation. Um, we had some windows at South Council Hall which. Um, sort of self-destructed with resonance and I'm just concerned um, uh, about the cantilever uh, solar panel arrays. I, I did find a document um, from the building's research establishment but it didn't seem to have been uh, specifically on uh, solar arrays uh, for carports, didn't seem to have been particularly recently updated and I, I just, um, could, you, could you confirm that uh, the wind speed and, and any kind of resonant effects are kind of taking into account projections uh, of increased uh, wind, both mean and gust speeds uh, for the lifetime of the carport. 
All right, thank you for that. Police officer, please. There's a, a very uh, technical question. I'll do my best to answer. But uh, again, perhaps the agent might be able to help. Um, yeah. The panels are obviously design, designed um, to be erected in the way they are. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the query is in relation to residents. Um, it's, a di it's a difficult question to answer, to be honest, Chair. Um, no, we'll, we'll raise that with the agents. We'll okay. have to speak to them in a minute. That would be great. That's fine. We'll keep that in reserve. Uh, Councillor Khan, please. Um, um, my query is about the uh, so, uh, about the, ac the exit from the uh, temporary car park, which is um, which passes by the uh, onto the uh, I can't remember what it's called, uh, the lane behind the uh, the um, district council offices. That exit is actually rather uh, um, difficult. I just wondered whether what the highways view would is on the increased traffic that will inevitably come out of the temporary car park. Thank you. Luke. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, yeah, so we've had a consultation response from the local highway authority and they've considered the development and, and the plan submitted, which include the temporary parking, and they've commented that there wouldn't be any adverse impact um, on the highway as a result of the development. Um, I, I speak as somebody who has had a, an accident coming out from there because of the speeding on the road, although it's 30 mile an hour limit, people don't keep to it and the visibility is not ideal and parking on that road is uh, haywire. Okay. All right. OK, thank you. Uh, moving on then, we've got uh, two representatives from the applicants. We've got uh, Mr Wingate and Mr Ingle, please. Yeah, sorry, I'm just literally uh, sort of on camera. says Paul Ingle here, so I'm the architect. Oh, right, fine. I'll do a very brief introduction. I'm sure you don't want to listen to me for too long. And, and Luke, to be fair, has done a very good appraisal of um, the scheme so far. So I'll pretty much just answer the questions um, that you've already asked. And then Alex will do a brief introduction yes. on yes. to the, um, you know, a bit more about the solar solar array and the actual boreholes and the way they work, etc. Right. And then we'll answer any questions. Yes, OK. But That's don't okay. Forget, you've only got three minutes for your initial presentation. Okay, are you ready? The screen is now frozen. Yeah. Okay, can you still hear me? Okay, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, sure. Right. Okay, yeah. So, so yeah, I'm happy to start if you like. Yeah, you got three minutes. Okay, perfect. Oh. Yeah. So, so yeah, um, we're the architect and agent for the scheme. Um, yeah, thank you to Luke for his um, for his appraisal of the scheme. I say we have very little to add. Um, just to confirm, there are no posts on the outside of the canopy, it is all cantilevered. Um, the design of the carports are specialist designed, um, so they, they, they have you know, been specialist designed with wind speed in mind, um, the structure, etc. All structural calculations and the foundations are designed accordingly. Um, they are very robust. Um, that kind of answers the two questions. So if I just, um, if, I'll, if I meet myself, then um, Alex can just tell you a little bit more about the actual borehole array. Okay. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, so as you kind of alluded to, can everyone sort of hear me and see me okay? We, we, we can't hear you very well. You're a bit quiet. Is that better now? Sorry, yeah, microphone. Marvellous. Um, so yeah, these measures form part of a wider project which will reduce the energy consumption at South Cambridge Hall by over 60%, which is obviously a vital step towards the council's net zero carbon ambitions. Um, Luke's done a very good job so far of uh, describing the project, although the one graph we'd have is that the solar carports have a capacity of 136 kilowatts, but will generate over 108,000 uh, 108, kilowatt hours per year. So that's 20% of the site's electrical consumption, which will be offset by the solar carport. Um, as Luke alluded to earlier on, there's the borehole array, which will be within the car park, which consists of a number of boreholes, which are drilled to 198 metres in depth, which is then piped back into the building to the ground source heat pump itself, which is within the server room. Um, that combined with a number of other measures, we're looking to reduce the heating demand of the building or reduce the gas consumption of the building will save over 90% of the building's gas demand as well. So it's a huge step in the right direction to removing the building from the gas grid. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have on the remainder of um, the project or, or, or any specific elements of the, um, the works that have been put forward. 
Okay, thank you very much. Okay, members, do you have any points of clarification you'd like to raise? I don't see any questions coming. I think you've answered those and we've had a very full. Chairman. Uh, yes, Councillor Bradnam. Just a quick one. Um, I just want to know how long do you envisage the installation will take to complete? I'm not sure that that's a planning issue. But, uh, I think we're talking to the architect and the designer. So initially this was planned so that the vast majority of the works would be completed within the summer holidays of this year. Now it's looking like the installation works will be taking place over the winter months, so may not be within those seven weeks that were previously put forward, but we would anticipate the disruption to the car park would be limited to 12 weeks. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. I haven't got any other questions, so gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. And uh, we we'll now go to the discussion, um, bearing in mind that absolutely nobody has objected to this. All the consultees are supportive, um, so I'd hope that we can move fairly swiftly to a decision on this. So does anyone wish to speak? No, shall we simply go to the vote then in that case? Um, there are two, uh, myself and Julius. Oh, is that right? OK. Uh, Councillor Halings then, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and I I just want to um, thank the case officer for the very detailed presentation. And I think I'd have liked to hear a little bit more to equal this out in terms of harms and benefits, as well as the car parking um, and the landscaping efforts, but also the fact that this is this is transformational as a local authority to be designing and constructing this solar carport um, and ground source heat pump, which will address you know huge savings um, on our bills, but also replace um, the cost of heating and water heating for the the building and also for car charging with an energy performance guarantee um, built into that. And so, you know, I think this is accomplishing. It's not just sort of complying with our climate change policy requirements. It is excelling and it is showing leadership and it's implementing our zero carbon strategy. And as many people know, I am baffled that you know, there was a decision in 2015 to refuse this on landscaping and tree planting grounds, which are very dear to my heart, but it should have come straight back in with a revised um, design because we actually lost out then on feed in tariff incomes and revenue to the Commission. I'm, I would to I'm move. not sure this is relevant to the planning application. I'd like to move that we approve um, this application chair. Okay, well, well we've still got one more speaker let's see what uh, councillor Ripith has to say please um i'll be really quick um just to say this sets an excellent example and we leave from the front um on this and let's vote for it because it's actually perfect timing because the car park is not being as um heavily used because of um covid19 so the next 12 weeks would be great Excellent. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, you wish to speak? Thank you, Chairman. Obviously, I won't reflect on uh, decisions taken in the past because, you know, it'd be horrible if somebody did that to us. We make decisions in the manner in which we are at, at that time. However, I do think this application is good. I will be supporting it and I look forward to seeing the results. Thank you very much, Chairman. Excellent. Thank you. All right, no more speakers. Uh, let's go to a vote. Do we need to vote? Is there anyone against this? I can't hear anybody. So can I say that this is the, well, I want to say that uh, the proposal is for approval plus conditions, and this would include the extra condition that uh, uh, Luke uh, outlined to us and the um, extra elements that were in the supplement. So if you're in favour of approval, then um, can we do that by affirmation, please? Agreed. 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 No one Good. That is therefore Agreed. approved. 
Right, thank you. Let's move swiftly on then to item 11. Item 11 is Water Beach. So this is reference S stroke 0009 stroke 20 FL recreational. It's at the recreation ground Cambridge Road, Water Beach. Uh, the proposal is to a replacement bowls pavilion following the demolition of the existing pavilion. The applicant is Water Beach Parish Council. The case officer will go through the key um, material considerations. This is before us uh, simply because the applicant is Water Beach Parish Council um, and there have been third party objections. So it's a requirement that uh, local parish council applications would have to come to this committee. So the um, recommendation of the case officer is approval. The presenting officer is Sumaya Makamaya. Uh, so Sumaya, could you give your presentation, please? Thank you. Can you please confirm if you can see my presentation? Not yet. Yes. Yes, yeah, got it now. Thank you. So as you said, the application is for the replacement and bowl, um, pavilion following the demolition of the existing pavilion. And yes, the reason why this application has come before the members is because the applicant is a um, Water Beach Parish Council and there are third parties objections. So the site is located north of the Water Beach Recre Recreation Ground, which is east of Cambridge Road and the rear, at the rear of residential properties numbers 21 to 31 Cambridge Road. And the and the um, Beach Social Club. The site is located outside the development framework of Water Beach and in the countryside and Green Belt. Towards this, the east corner of the site is the Water Beach Conservation Area. The closest access into the site is from Cam Cambridge Road along a public footpath that runs along the north of the recreation ground south of the bowling, net, bowling Green. The site has a boundary fence separating it from the rest of the recreation ground with secure access. The existing building is single storey with a floor space of approximately 38.7 square metres and is constructed from, the, from timber cladding. I'm just gonna go through what um, the location plan the site is aged red here, and Cambridge Road is this grey shaded area. These are the properties, the residential properties I refer to, and this is the Beach Social Club. Towards the south here is the um, footpath, and this is the application site. The pink line you see at the top here, that's the um, conservation boundary fence, sorry, boundary. So I'm just gonna go through the um, context, to just give you an idea where the site is. So this is Cambridge Road. These are the properties here that I was referring to, the residential properties, and this is the social club. Alongside the social club here is the public footpath that leads to the site. So this boundary fence here, that's the boundary fence of the site. And here is the access into the site. And this is looking towards the north and west side of the site. So you can see the residential property at the back here. And this here is the um, existing of the existing pavilion. And this is the close up of the pavilion, the existing pavilion here. 
This is looking towards the west side of the site. And at the back, you can see um, the residential properties. And then this is looking towards the south side of the site. And this is looking at the boundary treatment of the um, residential property, which is somewhat informal. So here you can see the site plan, and this is the existing situation. Here is the existing pavilion, and this is where the proposed pavilion will be on the proposed plan. The um, proposed pavilion will have a floor space of approximately 122 square meters. So the floor plan will have um, the, its main entrance um, from the south side of the building, which is here. And towards the west side of the building are toilets, faci toilet facilities and changing rooms. And towards the north here um, is the storeroom and kitchen area. This area here will be the bowling mat measuring a length of approximately 13.8 meters. So with this application, neighbours raised objections that the proposed development would be overbearing and would overshadow rear gardens due to its close proximity to the rear boundary fence. Also, they raised concerns that due to, these, due to its size and mass, the proposal would be visually intrusive. Offices agree that the proposed building will be closer to the boundary fence compared to the existing situation. So, for example, if we compare the existing situation and we look at this property here, which is number 31, the distance is 7.4 metres. Whilst the proposed, from the proposed building, the distance will be approximately um, 5.4 metres. And towards the closest point, which is on top here, and this is number 23, the distance is approximately 2.4, while the existing situation, there's no building here. However, officers consider that this space between the rear boundary fence of these properties to the building is sufficient and would not significantly overshadow the rear gardens of, this, of these properties. With regards to issues of overbearing and being visually intrusive, given its modest height with an eaves height of approximately 2.4, which is similar to the eaves height of the existing building, and having a ridge height that is, that would be, sorry, a ridge height that would not be comparably higher than that of the existing building. Officers do not um, consider the proposed development to be visually intrusive or overbearing that would um, harm the residential amenity or rural countryside. So looking at the um, elevation of the existing, you can see that the ridge height is 3.4. And if you compare it with the proposal here, which is a section, is 3.6. And if you look at the eaves height, oh, me. the eaves height of the existing, which is 2.5 meters, the proposed eaves height is only 2.4. Um, here is a and three, the representation of how the building would look like, as you can see, will be um, constructed of um, brick, timber cladding and render. So with regards to the key material considerations, they are um, principle of development in the green belt, visual amenity and impact on the conservation area, residential amenity, landscape, ecology and highway. Sorry, highway safety. So with regards to principle of development in the green belt, um, because the development is a replacement building in the same land use, and also it is a sport and recreation facility, it is compliant in principle with the green belt um, policies. And also, 
also, because it is a single story, we are satisfied that it would not harm the openness of the green belt or the visual amenity of the area. With regards to visual amenity and impact on the um, conservation area, the proposed development would not would be single story and therefore it would not harm the openness and the rural character of the green belt or the visual amenity of the area. With regards to residential amenity, um, because we have already looked at the size of the building and its um, proximity to neighbouring properties, officers are satisfied that it would not harm neighbour amenity. With regards to landscape, officers are, have recommended a landscaping um, condition. And with regards to ecology and highway safety, there are no ecological is issues or highway safety issues raised. And therefore, um, officers recommend that the committee approves this application subject to conditions and informatives. And for clarity with regards to um, consultation, this application is unaffected by the consultation error and a recommendation should be determined as per the report. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. OK, members, any points of clarification? I see uh, Councillor Bradman has one. Sorry, my comment was for debate, Chairman. OK, fine. OK, no points of clarification then. Um, oh, yeah. actually, perhaps, Chairman, I could just seek one clarification. Oh, shoot. Yes, all right. Um, it's simply to thank you very much to the case officer for putting those diagrams of the footprint of the building next door to each other, the existing and the proposed, because I guess we are confirming, are we not, that the new footprint is approximately twice as long as the old footprint. In other words, it affects uh, not just 31 and 29 now, but it would actually go across the backs of 27, 25 and 23. Um, case right. officer, can you help us with that? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Sorry. Um, uh, I would just want, I wanted to say thank you very much for putting the two diagrams together of the existing footprint and the proposed footprint. Can you confirm that whereas the old footprint only went across the backs of properties 31 and 29 Station Ro uh, Cambridge Road, this new proposal would go across the backs of 31, well, all the way from 23 to 31. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, I don't have any other speakers, so thank you very much for that. I don't have any um, public speakers either. So uh, that's you again then, Councillor Bradnam. We're into the debate. Thank you, Chairman. Um, OK, so uh, I think that's the observation, isn't it, that this is actually twice as long as the old pavilion and so it it intervenes between more properties and their current view of the bowling green. Um, it affects properties that were not previously that didn't previously have a bowl a, a pavilion behind them. Um, but as we know in planning no one has a right to a view and uh, given that this property, this um, development is proposed to be single storey and they are proposing screening on the west side of the site. So hopefully to improve the um, boundary with the back gardens of those properties from 21 or 23 down to 31 Cambridge Road. <coughs> I think this is not an unreasonable suggestion. It provides for increased um, sporting activity. It allows bowls to be carrying on indoors um, when the weather's not good enough to be doing bowls outdoors. So um, I think I, I don't think there's any reason to object to it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Ripeth, please. 
Um, just to say I will be supporting this application because I think it's um, a good one. I think it's something which is much needed and um, um, can offer a lot to local residents. Um, and just to add to the, yes, the building's been made much longer, but the ridge height and the eaves, um, the eaves height is actually lower, as the officer has said, and any windows, as it says in the report, um, which face on to um, numbers 23 to 31, are above um, eye level. And um, I think it's a good design and I would urge people to support it. Thank you. OK, I don't have any more speakers, so uh, all the uh, statutory consultees are um, in support. So I'm going to go to the vote now and the proposal is for approval subject to conditions. Um, uh, according to my notes here, the, the, this Walter Beach one is unaffected by the um, issue with the IT consultation period, so we can have a direct vote on that. So uh, Chairman, all those. Chairman, can I just can I just confirm that the condition for screening is is going to be added? The one suggested by the officer. Yes. Yes. I mean that is part of it. So the approval is. Uh, approval plus conditioning, including the um, uh, the, the uh, additional one, In including the screening. Lovely, yep. thank you. Okay, so uh, can I take this by affirmation? Then is anyone against? Can't hear anyone against. So that is approved. Then thank you very much. We move on to agenda item twelve. And that's on um, page 387 of our agenda. Um, the reference is 20 stroke 01085 stroke HFUL, and we're at number two, Butt Lane, Great Wilbraham. Uh, the proposal is a uh, second floor front extension to provide staircase, headroom, additional accommodation, and dormers to rear. This is a resubmission of S stroke 1306 stroke 19 FL. The applicant is Mr. and Mrs. Devo. Uh, key material considerations will be run into by the case officer. Uh, the application is brought to a committee, uh, referred to planning committee by Great Wilburn Parish Council and the officer recommendation of approval conflicts with the recommendation of Great Wilburham Parish Council. So the recommendation is for approval and the presenting officer is Michael Sexton. So Mr Sexton, over to you. Um, Councillor Bradnam, would you turn off your camera, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry, I was can find my thing. Apologise, sorry, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, it's over to you then, Michael. Thank you, Chair. Just two updates before I go into my presentation. The first is obviously that this is an application that is affected by the IT issues. So the re recommendation on the front of the report and in paragraph 70 um, will be updated to reflect that as I've, I've put in my presentation. Yep. Um, a further response was received by, from Great Wilburn Parish Council in response to the consultation on Certificate B, but they didn't raise anything they hadn't said before, so it hasn't taken the form of an update report, but I will just read that for the benefit of members now. Um, the Parish Council commented, members unanimously agree to maintain their objection to the planning application. Members want to reiterate their concerns over building work and request a robust traffic management be in place to avoid any problems. And I will move on to my presentation. So if you could just confirm, Chair, that you can see the PowerPoint presentation. Um, yep, got it. Excellent. So yes, this is uh, an application at two, but Lane in Great Rilbrum for a second floor front extension to provide staircase headroom for additional accommodation and dormers to the rear. It is a resubmission following a previously withdrawn application. 
Uh, so this is the site outlined in red um, on sort of the, the eastern edge of the village, um, perhaps more clearly shown on the, the block plan. To just take you through briefly the constraints of the site, it is uh, here outlined in red. It is an a, application where the property is within the development framework boundary of Great Wilbram. It also falls within the conservation area of Great Wilbram. As you can see from these pink houses, these are the listed buildings in the proximity to the site. Uh, and the green area is the, the green belt to the rear of the site. Um, but obviously the development is not within the green belt itself. For context, um, just four site photos. Um, the top left is the existing rear elevation of the property. Uh, the top right is the front elevation of the existing property. Um, Bottom left is the front elevation of number four butt lane, which is the property to the left of the application site. Just worth noting that there's this sort of existing dormer Juliet balcony feature here. And the photo in the bottom right hand corner is just the courtyard um, in front of the, the properties and the access is, is through this undercroft here. So what the application is proposing is um, essentially three dormer windows to allow a loft conversion. You have an additional catalyte dormer at the front here, which will allow the staircase to be continued from ground floor to first floor up to second floor. So this window will serve a staircase going up into the loft conversion, where you also have the addition of three roof lights. And on the rear elevation, you'll see there are these two pitched roof dormer windows. How that affects the building internally, I haven't provided a ground floor plan because the ground floor is, is unaltered. Um, at first floor, the only change is the continuation of the staircase up to the new second floor area, which will provide two bedrooms, both served by each dormer window, um, and obviously the staircase served by the front cat slide dormer window. To put it into the context of, of neighbor amenity, because I know that is a concern that has been raised locally, um, between the front of the property where this new dormer window will be and the boundary of, of number five, um, it's approximately 17.2 metres across that forecourt, so there's, there's a, reason, a good degree of separation there. The key material considerations, obviously the character and the visual amenity um, of the development, and officers feel that the additions are proportional um, and in, in keeping with the, the character of the area. There are examples of, of several dormer windows within the wider village context and within the conservation area of varying designs and scales. Um, obviously heritage uh, impact important to consider as the site is located within the conservation area. The application has been subject to consultation with the council's conservation officer for that reason, who is supportive of the proposal subject to condition. Um, so just in terms of addressing those first two points, there is a condition recommended, condition three, requiring precise details of materials um, and section plans of the construction, just to ensure that it, it is as compatible with the area as it can be. The residential immunity, the potential for, for loss of privacy from these, these windows. Um, the, the front dormer window serves a staircase, which is a non-habitable area, and there's a, a, a 17 metre separation from the nearest neighbour garden. And the, the rear dormer windows would obviously look out over the applicant's garden, so uh, with oblique views available towards number four, so we don't consider that there's significant harm there. Noting the presence of first floor windows serving habitable rooms on the existing front and rear elevations. Uh, highway safety is, is in there as an issue because, again, that's been raised locally, as I've just read from the updated comments of the Parish Council. Um, but Lane is quite a narrow road. It is quite a constrained site. Um, so acknowledging those concerns, we have recommended in Condition 4 a traffic management plan condition, which we wouldn't typically do for a householder application of this scale, but it is in response to those concerns and the constrained nature of the site to make sure that uh, materials stored on site and contractor parking um, is arranged in, the, in a manner as as suitable as possible. Um, and as for the updated recommendation in, in light of the discussions this morning, that is obviously now delegated approval subject to no further comments being received during the new consultation period that has arisen um, and that expires on the 21st of September. Thank you, Chair. Excellent. Thank you very much. <coughs> Any points of clarification, members? Yes, Councillor Halings. Councillor Halings, yeah, please. Thank you, Michael. So here, sort of reading the Parish Council submission and also representations by um, 
neighbours who are concerned. A lot of it is about the impact of the actual works. And so, as you say, you've included a condition which isn't normal in a domestic building. But what I see as being requested is, is one that's robust and enforceable. And I just um, would like you to explain, you know, in what way do you think the condition that's been attached um, meets that criteria, both robust and enforceable? Thanks. Thank you. So, yes, obviously it's a bit unusual to impose it on this scale of development. It's recognising that the there, there is a const, you know, constrained nature to this site. So what that condition will do and secure and, and being a condition it is enforceable, um, we would be provided with a plan which would indicate where storage of materials would be. I expect that may likely be in the applicant, you know, the rear garden of the applicant's property. So that doesn't affect other people who are using the fork or, or butt lane. And it really seeks to minimise the contract of parking. And again, given the, the scale of development, you're not going to get half a dozen um, contractors vans. So that plan should be able to indicate that the parking can be accommodated within the applicant's site in a manner that, that doesn't affect other users of the forecourt. So by virtue of it being a, a planning condition, um, they have to submit the details once those details are approved. Um, if there was a reported breach of those details, then that is something that could be subject to enforcement investigation. But we would anticipate again because of the scale of the development, hopefully a minimal disruption, but um, it, it really is acknowledging local concerns and the, the agent and applicant have agreed to that condition as well in response to those concerns of, of both parish and local residents. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Khan, please. Um, looking at the pictures of the uh, the elevations of the um, of, of the proposals, uh, first of all, in terms of the uh, the, the extension to, to cater for headroom for the stairway on, on, the, road, on the road frontage, uh, you, you, it's replaced with a single pitch roof in, in an area where most of the roof features are, 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 have got a ridge, a sort of double pitch roof. Um, has that issue been discussed or considered at all in the, um, in the uh, considering the design of the development? Uh, on, on the rear windows of the rear, uh, um, the dormers, you've got a long horizontal uh, window. Again, the, the, the windows in the remaining building seem to be predominantly vertical in orientation. Again, has that issue been discussed uh, and the possibility of breaking up the window in the uh, dormers um, discussed at all with the applicant? All right, thank you. Thank you. So if I bring up a, a pl proposed plan just to facilitate the discussions. Um, so as the description indicates, the, the application does follow a previously withdrawn scheme where originally there was a single flat roof dormer window across the full width of the property um, and that was felt to be inappropriate in design um, and, and heritage terms. So the applicant did come to us for pre-application discussions which we held in conjunction with the conservation officer. Um, the the cat slide dormer is one that in the view of officers um, is, is, is an acceptable addition to the front of the property. The pitch of that cat slide dormer has been reviewed and it has actually been reduced to the minimum um, sort of de degree of angle that you could get away with for the, the internal headroom just to minimise the impact of it. But certainly officers you know, in consultation with the conservation officer are satisfied that, that there's an appropriate design approach. Um, we did certainly explore a pitched roof at the front as well, but actually when you see that on plan, it didn't, it doesn't quite work. Um, and the rear dormers again we, we feel are appropriate. The, um, the, the glazing bar patterns uh, as you'll see on the plans have been uh, designed to, to mirror the, the glazing bars of the existing properties and the windows themselves align with the existing first floor arrangements. So there have been a, a number of discussions and different iterations which have brought us to the application that's before members now and we um, we feel as officers this is the appropriate scheme to to recommend for approval. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think for me, I wanted to just clarify um, a couple of the objections were on overbearing impact and loss of privacy. But I think um, Mr Sexton put up a picture that actually showed one of the other buildings in the courtyard had something similar in the front of it. Um, is it possible to just show that again, please? Just want to see where that is compared to where the current um, application is. Yeah, certainly just uh, clicking 
Taking my way there. So this uh, obviously is a slightly different style property. Uh, this is number four butt lane, which is the immediate neighbor um, to the left of the site, which you can see the rear elevation of here. Uh, so it, in this photo, it's to the left of where I'm standing. Right, OK, well, that's got a picture. Of, so effectively, that's that's in the front of that building. Yes, that's correct. And in effect, this, the difference between this and the court and the application would be that that one has a what do you call it? Cut slide instead of a. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a different style dorm. But obviously, they are different style style properties. Um, the one the application site is a, a sort of a two story property. The number four is a one and a half story property. So um, we don't feel that there's a particular conflict a harmful conflict uh, in the style of Dormer's uh, proposed. Okay. I think I just want to clarify in my mind that, you know, there was something similar already within the courtyard, albeit it's a one and a half rather than a, a two-story. Yeah, and as I said in response to Council Khan, we did look at a pitched roof Dormer, but actually seeing that on plan, it, yeah. it didn't, doesn't work for the, the style of property. And again, that was just noting what was next door, whether that was worth exploring. Yeah, uh, thank you. And just to comment, uh, if I may share, you know, I. Um, sure. The way in which the issues have been um, addressed by the case officer in his report has been very good and, uh, and clear. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. And uh, Councillor Bradman, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would like to, um, as Councillor Haling said, I would like to make uh, condition four slightly more robust um, in that I uh, she's just right. It does need to be enforceable, and I would like there to be specific reference. I don't, I don't feel we have to do it here, but I would like the officer to agree specific reference to where materials shall be stored, and I think that ought to be on the um, uh, uh, house owner's rear garden, perhaps, but that's for him to decide with the applicant, and where. The contractors vehicles will park and I think that also ought to be defined because the um, access down butt lane is extremely narrow and it's used but regularly by farm vehicles and the access as far as the building is used by all the other uh, occupants of that courtyard so I think we need to be clear about where materials will be stored and where contractors buildings may park Chair, if I can yeah, please. come back to the point. Yeah, I certainly think we can add in uh, a bit that perhaps says access arrangements for contractor parking and storage of materials, which should be within um, you know, the application site where, where practical or words to that effect, which I'm happy to draft and share with your yourself and um, and vice chair for agreement if that's if that's, yes, that's OK. That's fine. Good. Fine. Thank you. Thank you Otherwise, much. it won't be enforceable, will it? That's the thing I was pointing out. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all the uh, clarification for the moment. We do have a public speaker on this one, so if uh, Mr Lewis is with us, please. Yes, I am. I don't know if you can see me. I'm muted I'm on the video. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, no, we, we've got you in full colour. So Excellent. Fine. OK, thank okay. you very much. Sorry to keep you so long. No, I've been with you from the beginning, so I'm aware of the procedure and I'll kick straight off. Okay. So, Chair, members of the committee, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. I've also been asked to speak on behalf of the owner of number four Buck Lane, the next door neighbour to the applicants. The other household in the courtyard has not objected because they are close relatives to the applicants. I wish to make it clear that whilst two Buck Lane have two separate planning applications in for a stage expansion of this property, I'm objecting to 2001. 085HFUL and not their other application 200025278HFUL. As someone directly affected by this proposal, I'm in agreement with all the reasons for refusal put forward by the Parish Council and also by the owner of number four Buck Lane. I wish to emphasise the following and please do not as, as a committee underestimate the, the sort of misery and distress that this application has caused. My objections to this development include the overbearing impact this proposal will have on a small development in the conservation area. Uh, both the parish council and the two other neighbours consider it to be overbearing, although this may be in, contra 
uh, contrast to what the planning officer has said. We believe it would have a poor relationship with neighbouring properties as well as harming their amenities. It will not be in scale and character with the existing courtyard dwellings. It will be much bigger. Uh, the planning officer also refers to existing dormer windows in his reports, but neglects to state that these windows are, although he's said of one and a half storey, they're actually a two storey, an entire storey lower than those proposed, the existing windows are. The proposed dormer window, which serves a staircase, is also, I would say, much higher and not slightly elevated. And the impact and the loss of privacy to two other residential amenities we consider enormous. Now, I do request the committee consider this, please. When the planning officer visited the site in order to make his report, no one had heard of COVID-19 or lockdowns. Since the pandemic started, the importance of a garden as an amenity has drastically changed and increased. A garden is now considered much more essential to the mental health and well-being of individuals. If this proposal were to go ahead, because of the loss of privacy and the overlooking, we would feel uncomfortable going in and out of our back door and would feel uncomfortable and reluctant to sit in our garden, irrespective of the distance in metres quoted by the planning officer. The occupant of number four Butt Lane is also distressed at the loss of privacy to large parts of her garden, and this would seriously affect her right to enjoy this amenity. Now, disappointingly, the applicants who previously had an amicable relationship with their neighbours submitted their applications without speaking to their neighbours, hence it's had to come before you. Despite this and my immediate horror at what they proposed, I have tried to come up with some positive suggestions to mitigate the impact of this development. If this development is to be allowed, I would like to request that you consider the following conditions be placed upon the development. The new windows overlooking the garden of my house, number five High Street, contain opaque glass. The new front stairwell window, which is newly and directly overlooking the back door, utility room and garden of my house, have opaque glass or at least the bottom half clear and the top half opaque. Finally, I would like to repeat the new added emphasis given to the importance of gardens to people's wellness and well-being since the start of this particular epi epidemic and request that this be taken into account by members of the committee. It will demonstrate to the public that the council can adapt to these unprecedented times and, as one of you earlier commented, show that you're leading from the front. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you very much. Trouble opening up. Chairman, I wanted to ask a question of Mr. Lewis. Yeah, hang on. I was having difficulties with the camera. Can you hear me? Though? Yes. OK, fine. Yeah, if you want to. Thank you. Mr. Lewis, since the um, geography of the courtyard is quite hard for those of us who don't live there to understand, could you just explain to us where your house is in relation to um, the house in question number two? Uh, if you were coming through the archway to enter the courtyard, my house is immediately on the right and is connected to number two. Um, it, it's a linked attached property, in fact, uh, mm -hmm. there's a garage and a, and a room, bedrooms that go over the top of the archway and that connects our two houses. Um, what, okay. One other point, if I might very briefly, is just to say that one of the pictures from the planning officer, he showed a trellis with plants growing across there that actually doesn't exist anymore was blown down in the February gales. Um, I've tried to use garden cover to, to mitigate the loss, but because the new windows will be so high, they will line of sight will directly look down into my garden. The existing windows do not, their line of sight does not. And that's when the previous occupants of the house told me that. OK, thank you. And the other thing was, um, you said you were um, presenting on behalf of the resident at Four Butt Lane. That's Could correct. Could you explain, is that the one over the other side of the road? So if you if you enter the courtyard uh, and you face number two, number four is immediately on the right. If okay. you were coming out of number two's front door there, number four is immediately on the left. So number four is the one with the Juliet balcony. 
That's correct. And again, that Juliet balcony actually doesn't at the moment see into the other two properties' gardens because it is much lower uh, than the existing proposed cat side dormer window. OK, and um, what, what I was just trying to work out is the proposed larger dormer windows look effectively south, don't they? So I'm just trying to work out, is your garden detached from your house then? Because you're saying no, it's open. I have, I have a very small garden um, that is actually to the side of the house. It's a walled garden. OK. So, Councillor, it's my, the case officer Mark here. Would it be helpful if I bring up a block plan just to yes. help these would, discussions? Yes, would that would be so helpful. Thank that's, you. That's fine. Um, so hopefully you can see the, the block plan. Uh, Mr Lewis's property is, is number five here. Um, and his and garden? is this area oh, here see, which right. L shapes in and then number four with the, the Juliet at the front is is this property here. So so Mr Lewis am I right in understanding that what you're saying is that the cat slide window would overlook your garden? Yes it, it would not only overlook the garden but it would newly also overlook into my utility room and it, it would look it would have a much clearer view of me leaving the back door going to and from the back door. OK, and um, sorry if I may pursue this, just one more iteration. Mr Sexton, please could you show us the photograph where you had four photographs on the page? That's it. So are we right in understanding then and looking at the top right hand photograph, the cat slide wind, the cat slide extra bit is over the, if we look at the top right, it's yes, over that yeah. window immediately over the pitched roof. OK, I'm with you. Yeah, if I flick so, forward then Yes, it's it's here. So that okay. that's the existing window above the door, which is is to remain, and then the cat side sitting in in that area there. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Right. Thank you for that thank clarification. And then, All right, thank you, uh, Councillor Hayley, Ms. Spears. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to know when you were talking about, you know, if it was to be were to be approved, and you were suggesting having opaque windows. Is that something that has been discussed with the applicant at all? And do you know if they would be um, in favour of that? Um, the applicants have decided not to speak to myself and to the people in number four. Um, they sort of slam the doors and disappear. So that hasn't been discussed. If there was some way in which we could discuss it, Yes, uh, uh, and I thought I'm not against, I can understand people want to expand their houses. It was just something that I tried to come up with in mitigation that would reduce the, the damage to my life and my happiness living in this house. Can I, can I therefore, Chair, just ask the case officer, you know, what yes, are the issues around that? Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, we can ask, certainly ask the applicant. It's not something I feel we would be able to insist on or reserve by planning condition because it's fully acknowledging Mr Lewis's concerns. It is a window that's serving a, a stairwell uh, and a very small landing, so it's not a window that's serving a habitable room. Um, it is 17 metres from the boundary and our district design guide recommends 15 metres from habitable rooms to the, the boundary of property. So I'd be more than happy, particularly that we've given, we've got this additional consultation period to ask the applicant but I think that's as far as as I would be able to push it if they were to say no I don't think it'd be reasonable for us to impose a condition if they would say say yes to, to half the window being obscure glazed then obviously that would suit um, Mr Lewis so I can ask the question but I, I don't feel it would be appropriate for us to uh, put a condition thank you no and I, I and, and I do appreciate what you've done there Ms. Lewis and it's it's you know according to policy conditions we, we couldn't as you're saying kind of condition it but we do understand the situation that you're describing and so maybe that is something to consider. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. I don't have any more questions, so thank you very much, Mr Lewis. Um, OK, members, uh, anyone wish to speak to this? I haven't got anybody coming out. Sorry, Chairman, I'd like to say speak. Yeah, go on then. Um, Thank you. Um, this is really difficult, isn't it? Because the um, applicant is making not necessarily unreasonable um, attempts to in, um, increase the 
uh, amenity of their house and the neighbours are making reasonable representations um, as to why that would make their lives less enjoyable. Um, and there's the matter of it being in the conservation area and close to, but not in the green belt. Um, my feeling is that on balance, uh, I think it's not an unreasonable request. And I think if we can do anything to mitigate the impact on the neighbours, because by the very nature, I, I suspect these buildings that house number four and number um, five actually were subsidiary buildings to the original house in the first place. So I think it's not unreasonable that it should um, give due respect to those buildings. So if we can ask, as Mr Sexton said, if we can ask if they would consider um, putting um, opaque glass in the lower portion of the cat slide windows, I think that would be courte courteous of them if they would accept that. Um, and I think we should ask, but I, I think um, I'm minded to approve that with, with that um, informative. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, we have Mr. Carter before others, perhaps. Let me have All a right. Mr. Mr. Carter, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose what I wanted to say really was that um, th this window is to a stairwell, as Michael has advised. Uh, and so by its nature, it, it's unlikely uh, generally to result in, in significant overlooking uh, of neighbouring properties. We've also got to bear in mind the distance between this window and the neighbouring property, notwithstanding the understandable points of Mr Lewis, but the council has a, a guideline in that regard and this is beyond that guideline. So um, I think there are a couple of reasons there really why looking to uh, impose obscure glazing on a stairwell window um, in this kind of uh, situation, this kind of relationship, in my opinion, would be um, a bit a bit unreasonable on the applicant, really. Um, with regard to the dormer windows at the rear, I take a similar view that uh, the level of overlooking, again, as Michael has said, of, of neighbouring properties from uh, windows, albeit higher, but in a, yeah, with a similar aspect to the, the windows on the first floor below, um, is likely to be to be minimal if uh, if any additional overlooking would occur at all. So that would just be my view, and, and I hope that's helpful for the committee. All right, thank you very much. Councillor Heather Williams. Uh, yeah, Councillor Williams. My, on my screen, it says Councillor Nick Wright first, and I'd hate to take his place. But it's not on mine. Oh, is it not? Let's go, yeah. OK. Um, so I think this is, I, I can very much understand the, the concerns around the overlooking and how the proximity it is. Um, and, I'm, and I want to make sure that I listen to all members before I come to a judgment on it. Um, I think, but I, it was on the idea of conditioning. I, I do understand why officers are advising us that it wouldn't meet the reasonable tests to, to make a condition, but I still don't think there's an, there's an issue in us asking um, and speaking with the, with the applicants to see if, if that compromise can be um, found. And, just want to double check and reassure with officers, obviously there's been constraints on the site and concerns over the, the managed plan, management plan that that will, um, that com uh, there's confidence in officers that that can be enforced adequately because, you know, I've seen on small sites how those things can can really result in a breakdown of, of neighbours and, and that's not something that we'd want to see here. But we'll, we'll listen to others carefully, but they're my two, um, issues at this time. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Councillor Wright. Councillor Wright, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and I would urge councillors here not to try and change the application that's in front of them. But, you know, we have to vote at what's in front of us and we can't we can't change things to what we would like better. Now, to me, this application, you know, it is it is difficult. Um, what made my mind up is looking at the design on the photographs of those dormer windows on top of the house and that window at the front. They just look awful. Um, and you put those in a conservation area 
I'm amazed the conservation consultant hasn't objected to, and I understand why the parish council has. So it just looks weird and top heavy and just unsettles the whole balance of the house. So to me, I'm not so concerned about the overlooking, but I am concerned about the design and the effect that that will have on the conservation area. Those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor yeah, so Richard Williams. Yeah, Richard Williams, please. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, I, actually, um, I, I, I share similar concerns. I, it is a difficult one, this one. I, 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 I approach it with a very open mind. It is difficult balancing the rights of the neighbours and the rights of the, the householder. I do worry about the condition, and I, I think they there should be an enforceable condition if it does get approved about where the materials are stored. I think that could be a real problem. I do worry about the scale and the massing and the design um, as well, as, as Councillor Wright said. I, I must admit, I, I'm not moving this, but I had wondered if given that we've got this 21 day consultation, whether we might defer so that um, some of these issues can be looked into, but, um, but I'm not making that proposal. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank you. And Councillor Khan. Yeah, uh, Councillor Khan, please. I, I'm I'm betwixt and between with this one. I, I as I expressed, I'm not totally happy with the design. Um, I'm not really worried about overlooking. I think the uh, the garden will be uh, um, overlooked in any in any case. In terms of its uh, the, the rear window dormers are rather large and a bit overbearing. I, I've had another look at the um, the photos and the design uh, and the plan are uh, again and taking account that it's a bit difficult to look at the front of the building looking off the courtyard because you've got the building on of the uh, of the garage area on the left the linking bit uh, which which break which is not really how it looks in reality in in, in a front elevation an architectural elevation uh, and on looking at it again and um, I don't think it's going to be as bad as I originally initially thought or as it perhaps appears on the elevation uh, and certainly in terms of uh, overlooking from the front uh, from the um, from the uh, stairwell uh, area uh, that's looking over the courtyard I don't really see that that's an issue um, so I'm not really worried so uh, the large uh, dormers to the rear look out uh, out from the conservation area to to open countryside I don't think it's going to be really viewed from the street scene um, so on, on I don't quite think there's enough. I would have preferred that the windows in the uh, large dorm have been vertical in their orientation, perhaps splitting up into three. But I don't see that that's something that one can really impose. One deals with the application in front of you. I don't really quite think it's enough to refuse, though I've been hesitating all along. OK, thank you very much. Uh, that's all the speakers now. Um, I think we have already um, agreed um, uh, to put some more uh, bump into the traffic management plan and the storage arrangements. Um, Mr Sexton, is that something you, you're you okay with? Yes, yes, you're yeah, happy to, to add some um, some tie to constraints around that being within the applicant's curtilage or words to that effect, which I'll okay. bring back to yourself and vice chair. Sorry, and contractor parking was the other element, Mr Sexton. Yes, it would be a, a, an additional line within that that point A of the condition, which would, would address contract parking and storage of materials. Thank right. you. OK, fine. Thank you very much. Then. Uh, keeping that in mind, uh, the, um, the proposal then is for delegated approval, subject to uh, no new issues being um, coming forward during the amended consultation period. Uh, so that would include, we've, we've already done some more on the conditioning, which will be included. I take it that there, there will be um, a split in the vote, so I will take uh, a roll call on this. Chair, can you, Chair, Councillor Hillings, can you just clarify whether or not, apart from the condition around the traffic management, construction management plan, there's the request or not around the windows, or is that not a not being considered? Not a condition, but a, a request. I think that's an informal request. 
from us. Um, how would we deal with that, Mr? Uh, I, I think the difficulty with that is um, if they don't agree, what is the verdict of the committee? So an informal request could be made and if it was agreeable, uh, then a condition could be added to require the obscure glazing of part of that front dormer window. But if they don't want to do that, the decision of the committee would be it would be the same. I think it's an encouraging that they consider it. Yeah. So we need to it, understand I'll, that we can't enforce that. So. so I wonder then if it might be better that we uh, include an additional informative um, on any permission granted strongly encouraging the applicant to uh, use obscure glazing in that front door window rather than perhaps complicating the process further by uh, doing it the way we sort of initially suggested. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So let's say we're, we're putting Chair. informative in as well then, so that, that's the... Uh, Chair, could, could, yes. could, Mike, could Michael Sexton just bring up the slide with the um, wording on the consultation period. Who's speaking? I'm sorry. Stephen, is it? Yes, yes, Chair. Um, Michael Sexton. Yeah, Michael, can you bring that up, please? Yeah. I think yeah. it's quite straightforward. Do you want to change it? Um? No, I just want to. Uh, yeah, it's, no, no further comments. I, yeah. I think somebody was referring to no new comments. No, if we, I may, we've, already, we've already dealt with that, Stephen. We're now using the term no comments. So there was was no because previously it was no material comments, wasn't it? So we've dropped that bit of the word in. So that in order to say that there is, uh, it be reviewed if there's any comments at all. Yeah. You know? Is this all right? So are we deleting further? Pardon? Are we deleting further? Or does it matter? Yes, yep. it does. Yes. Yeah. Chair, if I, if I may, um, yes, the, the recommendation that's on the screen should delete the word further so that okay. as with the other decisions made today, it's subject to no comments being received during the consultation period. OK, all right. Given all that then, members, uh, let's have a vote. So if you're for or what you're uh, voting for is for approval. Uh, Councillor Wright, Chair, Councillor Wright, you ask to speak. Councillor Wright. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I feel I've got to come in at the end because asking for an informative to be sent about a proposed condition that won't hold any weight is a complete fudge. And, is, you know, yes. that's, it, it is absolutely ridiculous and we should be voting on what's in front of us and that isn't. An informative can be just abandoned at any moment and nobody's going to put in glazed windows where they can put in clear windows. It is a complete fudge. If you're against it or you're for it, you should vote that, but don't be fogged off by this. Absolutely. All right, fine. This you know, it's not what something we're actually voting on anyway, since this is an only an informal thing, and as you quite rightly say, it's not enforceable. So we could, my understanding is someone will simply have a chat with them. So let's not get tied up with that. So can we now do the vote then, please? So if you're for, that's for approval. If you're for refusal, you're against. And if you want to abstain, you abstain. So. Let's go then. Councillor Bradnam, please. Sorry, somewhat reluctantly, uh, I uh, agree. Four. Four. All right. Uh, Councillor Khan. Similar to Councillor Bradnam, somewhat reluctantly, I'm four. Four. Thank you. Councillor Harvey. Yeah, I didn't speak because I concurred with pretty much everything Councillor Khan said, and I would vote for. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, please. Four. Thank you. Councillor Haylings. Hoping that the neighbours can come together again, but therefore reluctantly, I would also say four. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ripith. Four. Four. 
Thank you. Um, Councillor Heather Williams. Sorry, Chairman, you wouldn't unmute me. Um, too much reluctance has been mentioned, so I will vote against. Against, thank you. Councillor Richard Williams. Against. Against, thank you. Councillor Wright. Against as well. Thank you. And my vote is four. So it's seven, three in favour of the recommendation, which is for approval will be changes to the conditioning. So thank you very much. That one is done and we now move to item 13 on page 401 of our agenda and this is the enforcement report. Um, is anyone with us to give us an update? Chair, um, I'd anticipated we might have an enforcement officer with us but uh, as we don't appear to do so. Um, I don't have any particular comments to make given this has come quite hot on the heels of the uh, the last meeting at the end of August. So happy to take away any questions as usual, but no specific comments to make. Thank uh, you. You don't know what happened at Fallbourne on the 28th of August then? Well, uh, no, not they paid. I don't, but I can find out for you. OK, fine. A any questions, members? Uh, Uh, Heather Williams, you wish to speak? Thank you. Um, there have been some serious ongoing issues for, for quite some time now in, in Arrington um, in relation to a building that's being built. And obviously as local member I know things, but I'm just wondering if it's possible to actually have, have it as an agenda item on here, given its significance and the fact that it's been such an ongoing issue. Right, thank, thank you. you. I'm sure Mr Carter's heard that. Yep, noted. I'll take that away. Thank you. OK, anything else? No. All right, let's move on then to item 14, which is appeals against planning decisions and enforcement action. That's uh, 409 in our agenda. Appendix one shows the current outturns. And we've got one of each. Are we withdrawn, dismissed and allowed? Is there allowed of any uh, consequence at Foxton? Yeah, the allowed appeal at Foxton related to uh, a uh, certificate of lawfulness. Um, perhaps it'd be helpful. It's quite long, actually, quite a long decision, quite detailed. I could, I could circulate that for the committee if, if members would like to read it themselves. OK, thank you. And only other comment I would make is on the final page, page 415. Those two appeals that were going to be subject to a public inquiry later this month, starting later this month, um, have now been withdrawn. Um, thank you very much. Uh, OK, anything else, members on that one? No. All right, thank you very much. That's the end of the meeting, Mem. Um, I just remind members that our, our next meeting is on Wednesday the 14th of October at 10 o'clock. So thank you very much for your attention um, and thank you uh, for everybody who's contributed to today's uh, planning meeting uh, and thank the general public who looked in uh, for their time. So thank you very much and we might see you in October.